morning and welcome everyone to the eighth meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee in 2021. Apologies have been received today from Beatrice Wishart, MSP. Our first item on the agenda this morning is evidence on the EU UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, and I'd like to welcome our first panel to the meeting this morning. Stephen Phillips, who is a partner with CMS, Professor Andre, no, Andrea Nolan, the Principal at Edinburgh University, Edinburgh Napier University and Convener of University Scotland's International Committee, and William Bain, Trade Policy Advisor with the British Retail Consortium. Um, I'll move straight to questions for the panel. And can I ask you each in turn um, what your view is on the trade and cooperation agreement now that it's been implemented um, for a couple of months and how you think it should be improved? Um, perhaps we could start with Stephen Phillips. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me to the meeting. Um, I think our view, or well, my view, is that the TCA, if you can call it that, is disappointing, but not surprising. Uh, I think the reality is that um, we had been anticipating something very much along these lines. Uh, if you go back to Theresa May's speech in January, and the single market and the customs union was a real doubt. I think it became inevitable that there was not going to be as close a relationship with the uh, UK, uh, sorry, between the UK and the EU going forward. And from the sector I'm looking at, which is financial services, there's not really a great deal in it uh, for financial services. There are some areas which hopefully will be better than anticipated, like data protection, where hopefully we're going to get some uh, protection on things like data transfer between the UK and the EU. But in other areas, such as mobility, professional qualifications, uh, and in terms of uh, particularly equivalence, uh, which whilst it doesn't replicate the benefits, the single market would give some benefits of financial services. We still don't have uh, any certainty whether or not those equivalence decisions are going to be made by the EU in favour of UK financial institutions. It should be noted that the UK has, in fact, uh, given some equivalence decisions uh, to EU entities which are operating in the UK. So, from that perspective, um, looking forward, what we're looking for, uh, I think, in the immediate future, there is a memorandum of understanding which is supposed to be negotiated by first first March. That again is not going to be something that will dramatically change. Uh, market access for uh, UK entities within the EU, but it is a very good indicator of perhaps where the relationship will be going in the next couple of years. The memorandum of understanding is supposed to be there by 1st of March, as I mentioned, but it is primarily about regulatory cooperation, which of course is very important from the perspective of making sure that uh, from cross border initiatives that there is proper uh, scrutiny of financial services on a European wide basis. But also, what's important about it is looking at things like uh, how equivalence determinations uh, will be made going forward and how equivalence determinations will be removed to get some degree of certainty about how that process will happen. There will also be discussion about what happens with international cooperation. Many of the regulatory standards which we have are international. The extent the UK and the EU can go together and implement some of these new standards as they arise is good for industry, uh, the FS sector in the UK and Scotland. So, from that perspective, if we get some form of agreement by 1st, 1st March or soon thereafter, then at least there's a sign people are speaking with each other that there is an opportunity for cooperation. If, as it seems possible, it's going to slip beyond 1st, 1st March, we would obviously have more concerns about the future relationship. Uh, the other thing, just to mention, in terms of what will happen in uh, hopefully this year, is that, as I mentioned, the equivalence determinations were supposed to be made effectively by 30th June last year. They still have not been made. The EU has made it clear that they are not in any great rush to do that. Partly, that is because the expressed concern over uncertainty about what will happen with regulatory standards in the UK post-Brexit, but also there is an element of trying to get some form of competitive advantage. 
So what we would hope is that some of those equivalence determinations, which the UK government has asked for 17 of them, will be implemented at some stage. But I think the EU will try to maximise its advantage by trying to get as many uh, UK financial institutions to onshore in Europe in the meantime. But those are probably the two main things that we look out for. Yeah. Uh, and things like mobility, that's going to be important also. So that, that's my summary. Okay, thank you very much. That's very helpful. I mean, some of the evidence that we've taken in the past with regards to financial services has been suggested to us that the adjustments would be easier for very large financial services companies compared to perhaps smaller sized ones in Scotland and that the Scottish sector would be particularly badly hit. Is that your experience now that the agreement is in place? I, I think it's an interesting question. I think that the larger financial services companies I mean once that speech was made in January 2017, just started that plan. So effectively, they have been impacted by the fact that they don't have some employees' preparations uh, to allow them to continue to work in Europe by setting up sub subsidiaries. They've got the bandwidth to do that. But you're right, in terms of some of the smaller organisations, uh, there's been very much maybe more wait and see. But I think that with some of them, because they don't necessarily have as much exposure, to Europe, what they have been doing is almost withdrawing from Europe to an extent, uh, maybe just waiting to see what happens going forward. But I mean, one example, not necessarily a small company far from it, is that, for instance, with uh, depositors' bank accounts of European citizens in Europe, they've just pulled out of that market. They've not set up subsidiaries to do it because the cost is just too much. So you're right. I mean, the smaller the organisation, the more likely they are to say, "Well, that's a pity, but I don't think it's worth our while." really uh, getting market access in Europe at the moment. Okay, thanks very much. That's helpful. Now, my, um, I, I know that Claire Baker is going to pick up on some of the questions around universities, so I'm just going to go to Mr Bain uh, just now uh, and ask about the effect on retail. And in particular, um, we've already heard about the impacts um, so far, but we know that after April, um, we're going to see impacts on imports, and is that something that you're concerned about? And will we see shortages? Uh, good morning, convener. It's great to be able to give evidence to the committee this morning. Um, I mean, in terms of the deal, we certainly welcome the fact there was one, uh, because if we had to trade uh, on tariffs in terms of goods, particularly in terms of food, uh, that would have added twenty billion pounds. Uh, to the shopping bills of consumers across the UK. That would have been disastrous in terms of cost, choice, availability and quality. Um, as you say, convener, we are at the early stages of the phase-in of the border arrangements. Uh, certainly in terms of goods going out the way uh, from the UK into the EU, there has been around about a 10 per cent drop in the number of vehicles going through the short straits. Uh, partly that is down to the level of stockpiling that went on before uh, the agreement came into force, uh, but also it is related to uh, obviously reduced demand for co from COVID as well, and with non-essential retail being closed for the moment. Uh, but the, as you say, convener, the real test is going to be what happens when the border controls are phased in. So in April, um, every consignment of uh, what we might call products of animal origin, everything from yogurt to cheese to meat to fish is going to have to be pre-notified before it leaves the EU to come into the UK. Um, and of course, in the first of July, we're then going to have the customs declarations on top of that. So these are uh, going to be real tests about whether border control posts are ready, particularly around uh, Ashford in Kent, uh, the site that's going to serve. Uh, Eurotunnel and Dover. And I think there are some concerns that some of the suppliers in the EU who send the food through that we all eat every day um, are are they completely ready for what's for what they're going to face? Um, you know, what is going to happen in terms of vehicles that turn up uh, in Great Britain which don't have correct paperwork accompanying those goods? So there are real concerns. Uh, that we could, at some points uh, of the week, have some shortages of certain foodstuffs. Uh, we won't run short of food; that's very clear. But we might not have the choice 24/7 that we've become used to as consumers. 
Thank you very much. Uh, that's very helpful. I'll now pass on to the Deputy Convener, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, Convener. If I could continue the questions to um, Mr Bain from the British Retail Consortium. Uh, the Convener has talked about the 1st of April, but I was wondering if you could give us some views on the Northern Ireland Protocol and the trade that is between GB and um, Northern Ireland. Uh, the reports that we have received from British Retail Consortium have talked about some difficulties with retailers getting their goods into Northern Ireland at the moment and concerns about the 1st of April, but there was a news last night that the UK Government have moved um, unilaterally to extend that uh, grace period. Um, I wonder if Mr Bain could maybe comment on what the current situation has been in terms of trade with Northern Ireland and if you have any reflections on the announcements last night. Uh, thanks, Ms Baker. Um, it is a really important issue because um, there are often trucks being loaded up from distribution centres in Cumbernauld and other parts of Scotland, uh, going over to Cairn Ryan, getting the ferry across to Belfast. And the issue is in terms of supermarket supply chains, because you are really talking about four hours from uh, the truck being loaded up, perhaps with multiple uh, products, multiple loads, um, and getting over to Belfast. And One of the issues um, in terms of compliance with the protocol is that the legislation which is given effect to in it on things like sanitary and phytosanitary checks requires 24 hours pre-notification. and That has been a real challenge and a real problem for Scottish distributors sending over uh, those types of products to Northern Ireland. So That is really the heart of the issue around compliance. Now, What we as an industry have been speaking to, to both sides, uh, both the European Commission and the UK Government, uh, about is can we find a way that satisfies the requirements of EU legislation, but does so in a way that reflects the reality of our supply chains. Uh, and That is why we had to have the initial grace periods. Uh, so There is a grace period on um, chilled meat products, it's principally sausages and mince, uh, and that was going to be six months. Uh, and there was also another grace period for other products that would have needed an export health certificate, uh, and that was going to last for three months. Now, in terms of what was decided yesterday, the effects of it, um, you know, continuing the easement, uh, we welcome the effects of it. There is no doubt about that. Uh, we would not have been ready on the first of April to go with EHCs for the reasons that I've set out about the the, the pre-notification uh, periods required with that. Um, however, we do need to have a really good functioning relationship between the UK Government and the European Commission. Uh, both sides agreed uh, with my colleague uh, Aidan Connolly, the Director of the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium and the Head of the Northern Ireland uh, Business Brexit Group, uh, to have common engagement and to test policy solutions before they were adopted. And That is really important, not just in terms of the present legislation on food, but future legislation on food that comes either from Westminster or from Brussels. So We do have some concerns that if the relationship breaks down, uh, because really, as far as business and as far as keeping food moving is concerned, we do need that functioning relationship. So anything that goes against that uh, is not welcome, as far as we are concerned. And thank you, thank you very much. Um, can I just change topic and move on to Professor? Andrea Nolan. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Bain and other members will continue the line of question that I started. But if I could move to um, Andrea, and maybe just as an introductory question, can I ask you? Obviously, the past year with the pandemic has had a huge impact on the higher education sector, and combined with Brexit, that means it is a difficult time for the sector. And I'd like an introduction on what the impact has been on staff and student mobility. Has it had so far an impact on students? applying to Scottish universities, and is it having an impact on staff retention and the ability to recruit at all? Thank you. Um, thank you for that, that, that question. The, um, I think the impact of COVID and Brexit, they've become kind of merged, you know, as we've dealt with COVID, that has obviously had a huge impact on student mobility. 
So, for example, at Edinburgh Napier, we have none of our students going on their outward mobility programmes. Our staff have been very creative in, um, you know, uh, working with partner universities in Europe and beyond to create shared programmes and shared activities to try and replace what would have been um, a mobility experience with a virtual mobility experience. But clearly, COVID has affected that enormously. And we hope that as we manage our way through and uh, the pandemic and, 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 and vaccination proceeds across the world, we'll be able to restore that because we know the impact on the students for having a mobility experience overseas, abroad, is hugely positive in terms of their uh, careers of the future, their learning, their confidence, and also how employers value them. In terms of staff mobility, um, well, obviously, staff have not been travelling over the last year. Uh, the, it's too early to say the implications of Brexit um, on staff. So far, checking our data, certainly, um, we see relatively similar number of applications, good, strong volumes of applications for staff, both from the European uh, Union. So I think it's probably a bit early to say. I'm not sure when people apply. Um, certainly, our experience in Napier is that they're fully aware of the new rules, the immigration rules, and the costs now of, of, of traveling and working here. Um, in terms of student applications from the EU, they are down uh, across the UK, across, um, across Scotland, by about 40 percent. Um, and it's very unclear, you know, the fee status of European Union students changed. Um, so from 2021, they are now considered uh, international students. So it's not clear if it's related to that or it's related to um, the whole perception of Brexit or, or COVID, because there's been a similar drop we've seen in, in Wales and, and in other places. So a um, bit early to say, but we have seen a significant drop in applications of European Union students to come in 2021. And in terms Sorry, sorry carry on. No, please, you carry on. Sorry, that's, I interrupted Professor Norman. Well, I was just wondering if I'd answered all your question, actually. Oh, right. <laughs> um, yes, that, that's fine. I suppose, reading through our materials we've been provided with, there is the issue of there is no, um, there's no standard approach throughout the EU for Scottish academics who wish to live and work within the EU. And my understanding, it has to be negotiations with Member state, there is no um, kind of standard procedure for people to go and live and work in other parts of the EU. That might be too early at this point in time to see what the challenges are with that. Definitely is. I think that that, that, that we're all trying to navigate our way, and 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 um, I think what Stephen mentioned earlier about mutual recognition. So for people for with certain. Um, Professions, you know, mutual recognition of professional qualifications is not yet sorted out in terms of bilateral arrangements, etc. So I think it's a bit early to say how it will impact staff going to live and work in the European Union. Um, for higher education, in terms of staff coming into work in Scotland, um, I think that we have the new immigration points-based system. Um, it's a bit early for us to say, but I. I hope that uh, because of the reputation of Scottish higher education, um, you know, the research reputation, the diversity, the quality of the education, I hope that it will still be an attractive place for um, colleagues from around the world to come and, and work in. And just finally, um, Kavina, if uh, Professor Nolan really wants to comment on the way um, the difficulty we will have in accessing EU research funds and programmes. And while Scotland's an attractive place to come at the moment because we have a very strong research base, what impact Brexit has on on that? Well, um, it's a really good question, and I'm really pleased you asked it. I mean, the one positive out of this is that we did a deal in terms of we are now um, able to access as an associated country um, Horizon Europe. Basically, the vast majority of the programmes in that you know, 95 billion euro over the next uh, seven years. It was hugely important to us. 
I think the challenge for us is it was interesting to see, you know, three or four years ago, the UK as a whole was taking about 16% of the funding, the share of the funding of that. And that had dropped to 9% uh, this year. And I think that was related to uncertainty. Are we in? Will the UK, um, including Scottish, you know, academics still be able to lead programmes? Is it, you know, so there was a lot of uncertainty. And I think our job now is to promote amongst our colleagues across Scotland, across the UK and across Europe. We are associated. We can take part in the programmes. We can lead them. We can shape them to really drive, drive back up that um, importance of being part of that a European research infrastructure. So that's a focus of University of Scotland and indeed University of the UK going forward to really get the message out we are key players um, and, and we are certainly been hugely successful over the years in Horizon uh, programmes. Uh, that's great. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. And we now move on to questions from Dean Lockhart. Uh, thanks very much, Convener, and good morning to the panel. Uh, first question is for Mr. Bain, and, and thank you for the panel uh, joining us this morning. Uh, Mr. Bain, in previous evidence given to this committee, we've heard that after initial problems with uh, the new export uh, requirements, things have settled down somewhat, and the disruption to the supply chain is now kind of, I wouldn't say under control, but it's now the disruption is declining. I wanted to get your views on how you think the supply chains uh, in retail and in other sectors, if, if you can talk about that, how those supply chains are holding up and whether you think we'll see continue to see ongoing progress as businesses get used to the new trading arrangements? Any element of this argument? I wonder if you could start again because you were on mute just to begin oh. with. Thank you. My, my, my apologies. Uh, thank, thanks, Mr. Lockhart. Well, it's been good to see so far an element of, of pragmatism in terms of the way that the new border controls have been applied on the EU side. There is still a bit of variation from member state to member state uh, in terms of some of them. Um, but what we have seen is a very low rate of vehicles being turned back. I mean, one of the, the real problems that we could have seen. Uh, we're seeing vast numbers of vehicles uh, joining a queue to get back into Great Britain because they didn't have the right paperwork. I think the rate of return of vehicles has been 2.5 per cent and declining. And I think that speaks to the work that industry has done to get itself ready uh, to make sure that uh, we have you know, the right relationships with customs agents, we have the right paperwork, it's all in order. Uh, everything's ready to go, and so things have been perhaps a little smoother than we've seen. But um, I think what the real test in terms of goods going outbound from Great Britain is going to be when demand picks up. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at flows of lorries and trucks that are 10 per cent below what they would normally be, uh, and there is evidence that some traders have just not been uh, trading as, as normal um, uh, because of the lack of demand. Uh, both in uh, the UK and the EU. So, uh, as we get further into the spring, I think we'll see uh, the real test of these arrangements uh, outbound. I think supply chains have been really efficient. I mean, we've seen that for the past 12 months. Um, you know, we have not had any problems with with people running out of food. People have shopped responsibly. Goods have flowed very well uh, from the EU to Great Britain. Most of um, you know the, the vast majority of the foods that retailers import uh, comes from the EU. So that link between you know Cali and uh, Dover and Eurotunnel is really central uh, to getting food on the shelves for consumers every day. So inbound, the real test is to come, and the issue is going to be: Are the small suppliers ready in the EU? Um, what is going to be the approach taken by UK customs authorities uh, in terms of paperwork that might be incomplete or incorrect? Will the border control posts be ready? These are the concerns that we would still have uh, as we get into April and July. 
Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Bain, that was very helpful. You, you mentioned uh, paperwork there, and I believe that that might be one of the issues, because we're not quite uh, at the fully digital stage in terms of everything being electronic. And, and that's something, some evidence the committee has heard previously, that that digitisation of the new arrangements is is about to begin or is under under uh, progress. Wonder if you could briefly touch on where you think that is. Is that the sort of like end goal here to some extent to have all this uh, move online so that uh, customs officials aren't looking at you know paperwork, different ink and different requirements uh, on paper. They are instead looking at something that is pre-completed online. So uh, again, um, one of the issues is that having a deal means that uh, we are able to have customs cooperation, and uh, so there's a couple of things. I mean, firstly, we have mutual recognition of both the UK and EU's authorised economic operator systems. Uh, that means, in the margins, uh, some efficiencies in terms of customs. We have a customs cooperation relationship that. You know, could build as the years go on. Um, so there are some welcome things there. Um, it has to be said, customs declarations will add significantly to business costs. Uh, we're looking at about £7 billion a year in terms of additional cost uh, for goods coming into the UK as a result of these declarations. Uh, but that, frankly, is a function of you know, having a, an FTA rather than a customs union. As, as the trading relationship, um, but we do have hopes. Um, you know, the UK government has launched a customs 2025 consultation process, and we hope that that might lead to further efficiencies and further digitalisation. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, that's very useful. And if I may, uh, one question for Stephen Phillips. Um, it's on financial services, which uh, Mr. Phillips, I believe, you uh, advise on. You mentioned there's still a bit of work to be done on the memorandum of understanding, which are, in your opening remarks, which I think is uh, our understanding as well. But overall, Brexit not Brexit has not had the the detrimental impact on jobs and financial services that some predicted. Uh, that's certainly what I'm hearing from business organisations representing financial services and uh, from many in the front line. Is that your sort of recollection as well in terms of the overall? impact on jobs and uh, services in, in that sector? Well, I think that in Scotland, the impact has not been too severe, I'm glad to say. I think that due to the nature of the business, I think that they have managed to retain many jobs. I think there is maybe a different message coming from the City of London, where certainly we are aware of jobs being offshored. Into Europe, so it probably has had some impact. Although I'm glad to say that in Scotland, maybe not as much as uh, elsewhere in the UK. Uh, I, I think, from that perspective, it's just a matter of keeping an eye on it as to what's going to happen going forward. Certainly, from the viewpoint of Scotland, and it's very substantial and very well regarded asset management sector. We need to keep an eye on what's happening in Europe because um, many of our jobs are based upon supporting. Uh, in terms of asset management uh, operations in Europe, if there's any change in the European approach to that, that could have an impact on jobs in Scotland. But at the moment, uh, I'm glad to say it's not had a substantial impact. Thanks very much. That's very helpful. And uh, thank you to our panel. Can you, convener, I think I've taken up my allocated time, so I'll uh, pass back to you. Thank you very much, Dean. I will now move on to questions from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, we note, of course, in uh, financial services that billions of pounds have been removed from the UK and exported to uh, to Europe. But uh, one of the things that Scotland has a particular strength in is fintech, in other words, technology to support uh, financial services. And I just wonder, uh, given that that's uh, not something that's explicitly covered. Uh, in the, uh, the, the trade and cooperation agreement, it being largely a services-based uh, activity, whether there is any indication that that uh, part of our economy is it, it's high margin, and of course, once you have a contract for uh, technology, it tends to be a long-term relationship. So, I wonder, uh, Stephen Phillips, perhaps in the 
uh, the first instance, perhaps only Stephen Phillips um, might care to uh, make some comment on that. Uh, Stephen. Stephen, you were on mute. So. Well, I'm, can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah. sorry about that. Um, but no, thank you for the question. I think that in terms of fintech tech fin, it's a very central part of FS sector now is growing. It's certainly an area we wish to see grow further. Um, I think the major issue for fintech tech fin personally is about uh, the people, the talent. Uh, and this is something actually where with Alien, for instance, with the universities, is it, the sweet spot for fintech in Scotland is the fact we've got a very good financial services sector, but we've got very good universities. It's that combination which does it. And by that, what I mean is that we actually get very good IT graduates. You've got the Edinburgh University Informatics School, for instance, which is one of the best in the world. And it's that union between those two which actually helps to grow the fintech sector. That's why they come to Scotland is because they actually can get very good graduates, very good FS expertise. Our concern in financial services would be that if there is anything that makes it harder for people uh, to not only to come to work in the fintech sector or the deterred, or more particularly coming back to universities, if we don't get graduates coming to Scotland uh, because of visa restrictions or just the perception are not welcome, we have an issue. And that's particularly true not only about students, but about lecturers. Uh, coming back to that point, which is we're only as good as people who are teaching the graduates who are going into the fintech sector. And when you speak with people in fintech, yes, they're concerned about market access, but their main concern, I believe, is where is the flow of talent going to come from? So I think it's a top priority for Scotland to be to continue to be attractive to both uh, students and lecturers coming into the university sector. Uh, well, in that case, I'll, I'll go to Andrea Nolan. Uh, because I think that neatly uh, segues uh, into the academic uh, world, and, and I should say, thirty to forty years ago, I used to take about a dozen students on uh, their sandwich year who, who were uh, doing technology when I uh, worked for the Bank of Scotland and employed hundreds of people developing <laughs> software. Um, so, uh, Andrea, is is what uh, we've just heard from Stephen is something that chimes with you because, of course. Um, jobs in fintech are, are, are relatively well paid, and as I, as I suggested, and perhaps that you might comment on um, the the relationships between fintech companies and uh, the people they sell to tend to be relatively long term. So, therefore, the loss of uh, any relationships or inability to develop them would be quite important. Is this something of which you you you're aware, Andrea? Thank you. Um, well, what really, really chimes with me is um, for fintech and, and, and for many, most sectors probably is that availability of talent and the strength that Scotland has in its universities. I mean, you know, four of them in the top 200 is phenomenal, and and the flow of talent into um, Scottish companies is hugely, hugely important. And the same goes for universities attracting talent. To uh, be our, our staff for, for now, for now in the future, it, it's very difficult to say. We we have had a drop in um, of forty percent in our applications from European Union students. Now um, that, it could, as I mentioned earlier, could be due to a, a lot of things. The um, whether those, those places, a welcome um, policy from Scottish Government was they are keeping those places, as you will know, were funded by Scottish Government. So EU students had free tuition in Scotland. So those places are staying with the universities, that funding. And so we will be seeking to attract Scottish students in to take those places. It's not entirely clear if the demand and supply will, will, will be met. So um, our European Union students were heavily concentrated in my university in business areas, but also in computing, very important for the uh, fintech sector, and also in engineering. And where the demand, the demand for, from Scottish domicile students is unlikely to map identically onto that. So I think the next year or two are going to be challenging us for us as we see how that uh, plays out. 
um, although we are seeing increased demand from Scottish students for higher education places. So hopefully that will map out in the future. In terms of attracting, as you mentioned, the, the academics of the future, Scotland does have a tremendous reputation for its universities. Um, I think the, um, how the new immigration rules play out, so we don't have a cap now on the number of visas we can issue, but for people coming uh, from the EU, if they don't have settled status or, or pre-settled status, they have additional costs of health charges. Um, so how, how attractive it will be in the future, it's, it's hard to say at this point, but all of us in universities seek talent from all over the world, and that will be the way we will continue to approach uh, recruiting both our staff and our students. So a bit early to say at this point, Stuart. Uh, right, and finally, a very small question for Mr. Bain. Um, one thing that came from the budget yesterday, which uh, uh, was enabled by our no longer being in the EU, uh, was the raising of the contactless payment limit uh, from £45 to £100. Uh, obviously, it will take uh, the, the, the uh, merchant acquirers a wee while to put the technology in place, but we can, we can see that coming. Uh, I, I do not know if uh, the British Retail Consortium has had time to have a think about that, but is that something that is going to be helpful? And are there other opportunities that come from um, being able to make some independent decisions, of which this might be an example. Mr. Bain. Uh, thanks, Mr. Stevenson. Um, I mean, on on payments, uh, it's it's not quite my area, but I, I can speak to what my what my colleague would say if he were answering this. Uh, broadly, we would we would welcome this um, because certainly in the current climate, it does. Uh, obviously, uh, contribute to uh, stores being more COVID secure. Uh, you know, people don't have to touch handsets and insert uh, pin numbers. Uh, so broadly, we welcome it. There, there will be obviously an adjustment period, uh, just as the machinery uh, is in place and the systems are in place to make it work. I mean, on the the point about um, you know divergence. Uh, what we've said is that the UK government should be very careful indeed about this, but partly for the issues we've already discussed, the protocol. So, if the UK was to diverge, let's say, in a food policy area, that of course would mean, you know, further divergence between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and therefore more cost in terms of uh, supplying goods uh, and potentially more delay. And of course, without a veterinary agreement. It would also mean more cost for goods going from Great Britain to the European Union, uh, whether it's shellfish or or any type of um, a product of animal origin. So, what we've said to the UK government is, if you do have any proposals to diverge, we would want to see a proper impact assessment. We would want to see what your assessment of any upsides would be from divergence, but we also want to know what the cost for business and the economy would be. Uh, and, and so that we can see things in the round and have a proper balanced consideration of that. Uh, thank you very much. I suspect colleagues may pursue that further. Back to you, convener. Thank you very much. Our next questioner is Ross Greer, MSP. Thank you, convener. Um, my questions are for Andrea Nolan. Um, I'd like to just go back to um, the issue of uh, Horizon uh, research funding and, and collaboration. I remember over the, the summer of, of 2016 speaking to Professor Nolan and others because we saw that initial burst of uh, European institutions who uh, were backing out of collaboration opportunities with UK institutions or were not wishing to, to renew them. And that's somewhat come in, in fits and bursts since then. But as has been mentioned, we have a bit more stability now. Professor Nolan mentioned in her initial remarks, though, that uh, UK share of Horizon funding has decreased in recent years, in large part because of this instability. So, what I'm wondering is, what can we do at a Scottish level? I'm sure in individual institutions are doing this, reaching out to their European partners. But what can be done at Scottish level? What can perhaps be done by government to ensure that we are renewing those relationships and making clear to uh, European research institutions that Scottish institutions absolutely not only still want to collaborate, 
but there is now sufficient stability for for that for those collaboration agreements to be entered into or, or to be renewed. How how do we tackle that? How do we reverse that decline in recent years? Well, it, it's a multi-pronged approach. Approach, Ross. There won't be there won't be one size. Through University of Scotland, um, and I chair the international committee. We um, and we feed in through University of UK, who are uh, meeting up with all the um, research bodies across Europe to really promote the fact that we're here. We're a great partner. We are hugely valued for the research that we do. Um, and I think for us, there's a job for us in University of Scotland to make sure all our colleagues are aware that we're there in full. There's a tiny bit of Horizon Europe we can't access, but basically we're there in full. We can lead projects, which is which was a big issue. You know, uh, where where we drop it down the pecking order, and and you want to lead and shape projects. So I think it's a multi-pronged approach, and, and and Scottish government need to just keep promoting the fact that. A, the strength of our higher education sector and the fact that we are open to Europe. We've had um, additional funding from Scottish Government for this year for internationalisation, and we're hoping to use that flexibly with scholarships to show you know, we're warm, we're welcoming. We want Europe at all levels uh, of higher education to be involved with us. So we will continue, um, uh, as it were, banging that particular uh, drum. I do think I do. I do. I'm optimistic that when the, the fog has cleared, and we, we are associated, but we're still waiting for the final sign-off. If you like, we're in a bit of an administrative waiting room, but we can apply. The first calls came out last week for Horizon Europe, and we we can apply. So what I'm optimistic is the the lure for academics of 95 billion over the next seven years. And, and the absolute joy of having being able to work in the partnerships that you had um, will actually really encourage people to apply, because we know if we apply, we will be successful. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, we compete at the top of the world stage on this stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if there's a, a a greater role, perhaps that there is already a lot of work being done for the Scottish government's external affairs team here for the for the hubs in Brussels, Berlin, Dublin, etc., to be working with. Scottish institutions and being being that direct point of contact um, across the, the continent. Is that something that University of Scotland already engaged with the Scottish Government on, or is this perhaps an area where we could pursue greater direct participation? On, on this committee, we've talked a lot in the last couple of years about the, the obvious change in the role of the Brussels hub in particular and trying to reevaluate exactly what Scotland should be using our, our external affairs presence for. It's a very good point, and, and, and we have engaged, but perhaps not not as much as we should have done. And I think we were maybe all a bit waiting to see how whether the deal, uh, particularly around Horizon Europe, was. And, and and it's something I will take forward, Ross, from from this from this meeting. You know, we did have a, a great. Um, our minister came uh, to uh, going global, the big higher education conference, but you, you know, international conference on internationalisation, if you like, in Berlin. Um, I can't remember if it was last. I think it was the year before last. I'm I'm losing track with the um, all that's happened, and that was a huge success. The minister came. We had a massive alumni event, and also showcased the strength of our higher education, both in our universities and research institutes, to the German, you know, um, higher education authorities, but the universities and and their Max Planck and other institutes, and that was that was a real success for actually building relationships. And showing we're open and we're keen. So um, it's a good point, and I will certainly take that forward. And if you would, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, just um, one final line of questioning around student exchanges. Um, we've this committee spent a lot of time uh, looking at uh, the Erasmus programme. Many of us are strong supporters of its continuation. It, we are where we are, though. So I've, I'm wondering if the UK government have reached out to University of Scotland. If there's been any discussion so far around the Turing scheme, have they asked you what what you need out of that scheme to try, to the greatest extent possible, to replicate the great success of Erasmus? Yeah, well, through through we we work in this respect with Europe through University of the UK. So the 19 higher education institutions, uh, most of them, 15 of them, are part of University of the UK, which lobbies the DFE, the Department for Education, and also the Treasury about um, 
about the association to the whole of Horizon and, and Erasmus in Turing. And as you said, we, we consistently lobbied across uh, Scotland and the UK for association to Erasmus, but um, it didn't work out the cost versus what we would get back from it. So we've moved forward now, <coughs> excuse me, to really making Turing a success. That's the most important thing for, for me now. So applications open in March. Uh, we're encouraging all Scottish institutions to pile in there to um, really have creative and positive applications so as we can make it as much a success as, as it as it uh, Erasmus could be. In fact, a, more of a success. And during the 110 million does appear to be able to offer the same number of opportunities um, as we had through Erasmus. Positive things about Turing, you can do shorter mobility, which are really valuable, and they are much more flexible for people who might have caring responsibilities or, you know, mature students. So that's a positive. There's a focus on um, widening access to these opportunities. So that really chimes with uh, Scottish Government policy and commitment to access into higher, higher education. And I think what um, you and colleagues in Scottish Government can do we really need it's only a one year one year commitment and we really need it to be um you know a five year commitment or whatever that we we have some stability in planning and also in communicating these opportunities to students of the future so um our focus twofold now really making it a success scottish institutions are uh, doing really well in terms of the first round of funding and um, making sure it's sustained Great, thank you very much. I'm aware there's other members with lines of questioning around student exchange and touring, so I'll round off there, convener. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will now bring in Jamie. Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much indeed, convener. Good morning to the panel. And as Ross rightly points out, there's a number of areas that I was going to cover on this, and um, that actually been covered. But it is great to hear um, from uh, Professor Nolan some of the kind of positives. Uh, around the Turing scheme, I mean, I think you know we all recognise that uh, the value of the Erasmus scheme, but we are where we are, and we we now need to look forward and try and make sure this works uh, not only well, but as as has been highlighted, that there are ways that we can improve uh, perhaps on the uh, Erasmus schemes in terms of in terms of access and widening access. But I very much take on the points that Professor Nolan was making there in terms of sustainability. Can I ask actually um, around around again Erasmus? The, um, one of the issues that's been highlighted um, uh, with the Turing scheme has been the reciprocal nature of Erasmus, and obviously that hasn't there hasn't been um, as much clarity on that yet. So, can I ask Professor Nolan what discussions uh, there have been, or that she, that she is aware of, around um, reciprocal um, agreements on student exchange with with the EU? Well, as, um, uh, certainly, I know Scottish government officials have been talking about this, and I think the regulations around Erasmus funding are quite nuanced, and so European Union institutions have probably have flexibility that about 20% of their funding they can use to send into non-associated countries, and the UK would be one of those. And um, I don't know the ins and outs yet, and I don't think they have full clarity either, but. I'm hopeful, they're hopeful, we're all hopeful that uh, the nuances around the, re or the, the way the uh, regulations could be interpreted would um, ensure that our European partners can send students to the UK under the Erasmus umbrella. Now, clearly they can't use all of the, I presume they can't use all of the 20% to come to the UK, but, but, but that is one, um, one um, possibility which will which will help. All of us are talking to our partners, our partners we've had for 40 years, to say, well, how can we make this work um, in terms of you know mutual exchange programs? And I know our minister is meeting with um I think EU commissioners about Erasmus and how the, the op options we have under the current agree agreement, lack of agreement for for the UK to ensure that we keep uh, mobility going. So there's, there's sure. lots of discussion. And through the Universities UK, we are meeting up with the kind of mobility agencies in each of the countries to really drive this. 
uh, the UK is a, a top destination for Erasmus students, and we yeah. hope it will stay that way. Yeah. So, well, th thank you for that. C can I ask it again? It's, it's, I suppose it's, it's linked into this kind of point, but you know, one one of the criticisms, and I say I, you know, I, I very much welcome. I, so I very much recognise the positives of Erasmus. So this is not a criticism, but one of the criticisms that there could be um, is that obviously it was it tended to make us focus on on one one kind of part of the world, whereas the Turing scheme is looking at a more kind of global uh, uh, approach. Um, I suppose how, how positive do you think that can be? Uh, does it is it is it covering some areas that perhaps we already had agreements in terms of student exchange, or is this a kind of whole new opportunity um, for a wider reach than perhaps we've had we've had before um, it, when just focusing perhaps on EU nations? Um, well, I think it's worth knowing that I think across the UK, I don't have the figures for Scotland, that about 50% of our mobility is not through Erasmus, was through to other parts of of the world. So, you know, my own institution has students going to partners in China and um, so in, in America. So, Turing just, I suppose, um, formalised of that. I suppose the issue with they're all done on an individual basis. The um, the strength of Erasmus was that collective nature, and um, we were part of a big scheme where the rules were all the same. Um, whereas when you're dealing with, um, you know, the whole world, it's not, you know, on a on a bilateral basis, it can be it can be challenging. But there are opportunities there. There's no doubt about it, and and we'll exploit them to their fullest. That's super. Well, um, thank you for that. Thank you for the positivity on that, because as I say, I think it's um, you know, it's been an area of uh, of concern. But um, I appreciate that there's there's more needs to be done on the sustainability angle to make sure that. Uh, not only we get it right now, but also we make sure that it's something that we can continue to get right kind of going forward. So thanks very much for your answers on that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Kenneth uh, Gibson now. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, and first question is really to Mr Phillips, and it's just to uh, quote back something he said to the committee on the 20th of November when he said that not being part of the single market means that companies need to make alternative arrangements, which they have done by setting up subsidiaries. Uh, that is not necessarily the end of the world. It just adds to the cost and means that certain people have to be transferred out of Scotland to service those companies. We have touched on this issue already this morning, but the Sunday Times reported uh, just at the weekend that 7,600 finance sector jobs have relocated to the EU, with 67 per cent of companies actively considering relocation. So I'm just wondering uh, what the situation is in Scotland relative to the rest of the UK. Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, I, think it, I think it depends very much upon the individual sector. Um, one of the reasons why, I mean, I, I don't know if you saw the press reports, for instance, that Amsterdam, for instance, had overtaken um, uh, London, in terms of trading in euro shares, I mean, yeah. the other aspect is about, for instance, whilst equivalence has been given, for instance, in terms of derivatives clearing, that's only until June 2022. So, some areas like equity markets, debt capital markets, which are very important, which are heavily dependent on the nature of the single market, uh, they are heavily focused in London. So, I think there have been quite a few jobs which have moved, and I think that. Going forward, depending upon how the relationship develops, I think that many companies uh, in the UK are looking to see uh, whether or not they need to move offshore some of those jobs into Europe going forward. So I think there will be job transfers. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Scotland at the moment is not insulated from it, but it's not as badly affected, partly because we're dependent upon areas like sort of retail banks, where to an extent that they had business in Europe, they've sort of onshored that back into the UK. But also we have asset management, where definitely there have been jobs transferred, for instance, to um, Dublin and Luxembourg. But at the moment, whilst those jobs have gone and those are jobs that basically we would rather keep in Scotland, uh, they are not limited because if you transfer to a subsidiary in the EU, you need to have real functions there. You need to have CEOs, financial officers, risk officers. It's got to be a real operation. But quite a lot of that work can be delegated back to Scotland. Uh, so to the extent, yeah, there will be transfers of jobs forward, I believe, but maybe not as severe as is happening in London. 
as I mentioned to Mr. Walker earlier on, I think what the big concern would be is that if there was a difference in approach in the EU, and it's already been flagged in the European Parliament, where people are saying, well, quite a lot of this work has been done in the UK, but rather it was done in the EU uh, in terms of areas like asset management, is if they start changing those rules, which would not only affect the UK, but the rest of the world, and insist that more of the work which has been offshore to the UK is done in the EU, that would have a significant impact upon employment in Scotland. Yes, I mean, it's a future I'm really obviously th thinking about. I mean, Politico has suggested that uh, you know the EU is holding back from declaring the UK equivalent in investment banking and trading because it's worried about British deregulation, putting the bloc's financial stability at risk. So, Although I don't think we've seen the, the job losses that some people feared, I'm worried about uh, two things. First of all, a dripping tap effect, and that possible EU um, decisions could mean that people decide not to invest in the future. So, rather than so, so you know, inhibiting the growth of the sector is that something that you have concerns about? Um, you know, what, what's your feelings on that particular issue? I, I do have some concerns, although it really will depend, as you mentioned, about what goes forward, because. I mean, as you correctly identified, the EU is not giving equivalents for two reasons. One, because they've got concern about the regulatory change in the environment. But I think the main reason at the moment is they wish to get a competitive advantage. So they're keen to encourage as many uh, institutions to transfer jobs to the EU as possible. And probably once they think that process has happened, maybe later on this year, they may actually go towards equivalents because as you'd imagine, the UK is equivalent at the moment uh, with the EU. I mean, what's going to effectively um, determine what's going to happen is about the level of cooperation there is between the UK and the EU. If you're looking at it from the perspective of a multinational company who comes to Scotland because it's got very good people, quality of life is a major thing, uh, and as Andrea mentioned, uh, university graduates. Is that from their perspective, they can deal with different jurisdictional issues about us being a bit different from the EU. What they don't want is some form of regulatory bonfire where we are significantly different from the EU and we have very different standards because that just actually makes life very difficult. So I think from our perspective is to minimise those job losses, it's actually not to uh, distance ourselves unnecessarily from the EU. Try to keep things as close as possible, unless there's good reason not to. But also to have good cooperation with the EU. I think it will very much depend upon the relationship going forward, and that's a difficult one to predict at the moment. I mean, I, I fully understand how difficult it is to predict, but we're talking about perhaps minimising job losses here or there. Are there any major growth opportunities that you see for the sector going forward? Um, you know, as a result of Brexit, for example. The, the, the only, I mean, there's two areas. I mean, not because there's one which is not about Brexit. That's just fintech, tech fin, where Scotland's actually got an advantage, where it certainly is one of the best centres in Europe for it. So we need to continue with that. I think the opportunity from Brexit is potentially, if uh, in two ways, potentially, is that if there are trade treaties which are being done by a number of countries, uh, then potentially improving UK access to those markets, particularly the Indo-Pacific, may have an impact, particularly on asset management. And secondly, is that in terms of regulatory reform, whilst I say we wish to keep as close as possible to the EU unless necessary, there are certain things like safe for sake of argument building societies or insurance companies and the solvency too, where you can tweak some of the rules to make it a bit more competitive. So yeah, there are some things we can do. Uh, again, how that compares with the lack of access to Europe is another question, but there are certainly some things we can do. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and, and Professor Nolan, um, um, you know, um, Wendy Alexander and her evidence to the committee said that, and I quote, we've won competitively $755 million over the last six years of the Horizon 2020 programme. All of that will go unless we are participants in the next scheme. Where are we on Horizon um, in, in terms of uh, developing? Um, uh, uh, links to the next scheme. We we, we are an associated um, country now, so we are just waiting for the association agreements to work their way through um, the um, administrative and legal process. 
we can all apply now to the Horizon programmes. Um, and as long as the association agreement is signed by the time uh, the money is awarded, then that is fine. So it was, uh, a, and, and virtually every aspect of Horizon Europe, the European Research Council, the Maria Skodalska, the part, most of the um, innovation uh, council programmes are available to um, Scottish and UK researchers. So it is as good a deal, I think, as, as we, we could have hoped for. So um, great relief. We are very happy that that has been secured because it would have been a huge blow to UK research and science had that not been achieved. So you see, in effect, uh, everything moving smoothly as previously, or do you see any blips on the horizon, on the horizon with horizon? <laughs> No, I, I don't see any blips at the moment. But however, one is in this kind of situation, you're hyper vigilant. Um, I don't see any blips. I mean, as long as the association agreements are signed, uh, which there is no reason that they should not be now, um, I don't see blips. I think, as I mentioned earlier, um, our job in the university sector um, and, and research institutes and, and across companies, because of course companies can access Horizon Europe is to really make sure people understand we're in, we can keep going forward. The uncertainty of the last four years is now lifted, so let's make the most of it. Okay, thank you very much. And that's great, thank you. And Mr. Bain, um, we've taken a lot of evidence uh, in recent weeks about obviously the implications in terms of uh, costs for businesses that are doing uh, that are, are trading um, with Europe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one of the issues of concern to me uh, is dipping the toe in the water of, it, of exporting. I mean, um, do you feel that um, you know businesses will be less enthusiastic about exporting or indeed importing, and how would that affect your sector as we go on? Do you think there's a kind of reticence at the moment, or do you think people are keen to to make the best of it and move forward? How, how do you feel the kind of general? Uh, viewers of the retail sector in terms of exporting and importing, uh, taking in, uh, uh, taking into account all the issues that have already been discussed with regard to costs, uh, markets, uh, shipping, etc. Uh, thanks, Mr. Gibson. Um, well, I think it depends on the size of the company. I mean, I think uh, the larger retailers, I think, have more capacity to, um, you know, deal with the new. Requirements for either importing or exporting goods for SMEs. This is perhaps a whole new, different world because we had um, uh, over 200,000 SMEs in the UK, which only uh, traded with the EU, so they didn't ever have to deal with customs or rules of origin um, or these sorts of problems. I would identify two areas where I think there is real reticence, um, and even among some of the largest retailers, there's been a problem. And the first area is rules of origin. So, um, as we know, uh, with a trade agreement rather than a customs union, um, it's only qualifying goods uh, which get the zero tariff treatment, and that means that there are product-specific rules of origin for every commodity, from trousers to aubergines, uh, which have to be complied with to get that zero tariff treatment. And that has been quite onerous, given some of the supply chains that operate. So I'm sure the committee will have seen the examples that some of our members uh, had in the UK press in the last few weeks. Um, you know, with goods that are made in the EU coming to a distribution centre in the UK, then being re-exported to the EU, uh, potentially, you know, just ROI. Uh, and many uh, retailers work on a GB and Ireland uh, corporate basis. And those goods have been subject to tariffs because they are not uh, qualifying in terms of the agreement, and that is a major problem. Uh, now there are some mitigations, things like customs warehousing, return goods relief, but they're costly. They involve a lot more red tape, and so I think we are seeing the difference with with that compared with what we had before the 31st of December. The other issue where there's real reticence on the part of retailers. Uh, in terms of trade is in relation to e-commerce packages. I am sure the committee has seen, and we can provide examples from our membership, uh, you know, the stories about uh, you know, the VAT not being able to be taken 
at the point of sale on an online purchase, where a UK company is supplying an EU customer, it's been levied at the point of delivery. Uh, consumers are saying we didn't know we were going to have to pay 100 or 200 euros in extra tax. We don't want the goods, and so that is causing real problems in e-commerce. We've called for a summit on e-commerce because we need to get, we think, the logistics industry, the retail industry, VAT, um, customs, and governments together to tackle this. We've got a real problem on, on e-commerce. Yeah, that, I mean, I mean, I do think that's a major issue, etc. And I mean, I think, I think for me, the issue is confidence. It's about whether or not businesses feel they want to remain in the import-export business, or indeed if they're not in it already, whether they think it's worth the candle in doing that. And I feel that that could ultimately have long-term, uh, uh, obviously, impacts on the on the UK, not least because obviously it will. Despite the government, UK government's commitment to free trade, it will actually reduce the amount of free trade in the event because if fewer companies are in are in various sectors, then competition declines um, it, it, with all that entails. So, in terms of e-commerce, so what progress is being made on that at the moment? Um, well, it will improve a little bit, Mr. Gibson, in July because the EU is uh, <coughs> launching what's called the One Stop Shop uh, for third country retailers. Uh, which retailers in Scotland will fall within. Uh, so that will mean that VAT can be levied at point of sale. Um, so it will diminish but not eliminate the problems that people have had in Germany or in the Netherlands having to pay at the doorstep um, or at their postal services office uh, additional charges. So it will take away the issue in terms of the VAT on the good. What it won't deal with is the issue about um, postal service handling charges, VAT on the insurance and transit of the goods. So we're still going to have a problem even after July, and that's why we need to get. Uh, we've recommended getting all the players in e-commerce together to have a summit to look at short-term and long-term solutions on this. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. That's very helpful, very instructive. Thank you. Thanks, Kavina. Thank you very much, Mr. Gibson. Um, now we have questions from Christine Gray and MSP. Yeah, thank you very much, convener. I get three questions, so I'll I'll put the three questions out, and I think they're mainly to actually Mr. Bain. Though I'm happy for any other panel uh, member to answer them, and you know, good good morning. I nearly said good afternoon. That just seems seems a long time. Anyway, the first question is a comment made by you, uh, Mr. Bain, right at the beginning when you said there won't be empty supermarket shelves, but there will be a reduction in choice. Have you any idea, on behalf of your organisation, which products are likely to um, vanish from our shelves or be thin on the ground, uh, and why this would happen, or which European nations these come from? The first question. The second question, again, Mr. Bain, you touched on the impact of COVID, you know, which, which compounds uh, this period of leaving uh, the EU and Brexit. Now. I know I myself have changed my shopping habits, and I'll be just like lots of other people. I'm thinking in particular in the retail sector and clothing. If people are not browsing in shops, if they're not working in offices but working mainly from home, I think there'll be a substantial impact on that particular part of the clothing sector. So it's not just what we shop for, but also how we shop. Again, we all know what's happening. People are shopping online, so I'd, I'd like to know. Has there been any analysis about the, pr the prospective loss because of the way we are changing our habits due to COVID, and added to that the impact of Brexit, uh, not just on businesses and on uh, the retail sector? And thirdly, in the more recent evidence, I, I note uh, Mr. Bain. I wasn't listening to everybody else, by the way, but it's Ms. Mr. Bain I picked up on. Um, you said that uh, Brexit. We have thousands and thousands of um, SMEs, small medium enterprise businesses, and they've actually most of those imported and did business just with the EU. So this a whole lot of um, forms have got to fill in all this about um, you know origin, country of origin, everything is a bit of a mystery to them. And compounding the difficulties, I think I've already listed. Can you advise if the guidance issued by the UK was timious? And if it is comprehensive and simple enough for these small businesses who can't employ somebody to do it, 
and analyse all of them for them to cut through all this new red tape. Thanks, thanks Ms. Graves. Th thanks, Ms. Graves. Some some great questions there. In terms of um, if I can sort of take them in in turn, um, where are the where are the problems going to come with fresh produce? Um, I would say, I mean, if we end up getting delays, um, you know, of goods, you know, coming through Cali into Dover into Eurotunnel, the biggest problems are going to be around fresh fruit and vegetables because these have quite short shelf lives, and obviously we've become used to consumers being able to buy them 24/7, uh, you know, even from the local the local store, uh, you know, uh, you know, taking away the issue of going to the superstore for them. And so, consumer expectations have, have increased quite a lot over the last few decades. And so, I think that it's it's those type of products, the tomatoes, the strawberries, the apples, where the broccoli, um, where I think we could have some issues just with maintaining that sort of twenty four seven seven day a week supply. And that's where you might get some gaps on the shelves um, if this doesn't go well from from April. So it's, it's really those those products. Very short shelf life products uh, that will get the highest risk of, of disruption, and, and that's really just caused by if the arrangements for goods coming into Great Britain are not smooth, if we get lots of delays, if we get lots of paperwork being wrong, trucks and lorries being held, uh, that we get into um, many more uh, problems in that that respect. In terms of um, uh, SMEs, as you mentioned, Ms. Graham, um, there is a sort of explosion. I mean, the thing we've got to remember is this is the this is the largest imposition of red tape on businesses, for, really, for 50 years. Um, you know, there have been an immense amount of new regulations to have to come to terms with very quickly, and so uh, some of the guidance, um, you know, has been prepared in good order. We were dealing with some of our companies with guidance on the protocol, for example, uh, you know, in terms of getting goods, e-commerce packages from uh, Great Britain over to Northern Ireland with 11 hours' notice uh, on Hogmanay. Now, I don't think anyone regards that as a suitable state of affairs, and I think it's also the case that in some areas, like rules of origin. Um, you know, like um, the issue about distribution centres, that some of the guidance that the EU has prepared is of more detail and more relevance to companies than that which the UK government has prepared. So we do need to get more detailed and more tailored guidance from the UK government. Uh, that's a point we've made to them repeatedly. That would really help businesses. In terms of how COVID is is sort of changing uh, consumer shopping habits. Um, we can send to the committee the, the most recent copy of the Scottish Retail Consortium's uh, footfall and, and um, uh, retail sales figures. What they do show is quite a big drop. Um, obviously, comparing um, you know part of the first quarter in 2020 uh, and where we are now in terms of like for like sales, you know, you're talking about a 20% drop. Um, that is particularly pronounced in terms of areas like clothing and textiles. And um, I think the real problems around clothing and textiles are those we talked about. Um, you know, rules of origin. Um, I was speaking with uh, a member yesterday who who said, if I'm importing trousers from from Italy and they have buttons produced in Turkey. Um, am I still allowed to bring that in and get those tariff free? Um, and so you're going through this level of detail with every single item to work out whether it qualifies, and the cost and the time being taken for that is considerable, really considerable. Um, and so clearly, if you're uh, dealing with uh, e-commerce sales uh, with these types of items, and you have rules of origin compliance. As well as the issues about VAT that we've talked about, uh, then it really can be very off-putting uh, for retailers to continue with this. So, again, it's a real concern, and we could be in some difficulty. Two very brief supplementaries, if I may, following on those answers, convener. Um, were you consulted on the guidance uh, from the UK government um, before it was issued? 
And are you being listened to now? Uh, now you're telling me the EU guidance is more detailed, more helpful. You say you've been negotiating and contacting the UK government. Are you being listened to? That's the first bit. And the second bit, which I don't know if this is too broad a question, but it strikes me that our economy is very much based on consumerism, um, you know, and also on credit. Now, the impact of COVID on consumerism, in my view, it may be temporary, but has changed our, our habits about where we put our money and why we put our money there. But there's also an impact on consumer credit because people have lost their jobs and there's more probably will go. So again, is your is the retail sector analysing how this could impact on them as well? And you know, in communication with the Chancellor, because I think this is a, a bigger problem. Uh, than I anticipated. I uh, maybe got it wrong, but I think these two things together, compounded by COVID, Brexit, the consumer society, people will not be taking credit, they can't afford to do it. You know, how is that all going to compound things for you? Maybe that's too big a question. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I would like your comments if you can give them. Yeah. Uh, the first one on the guidance and then on the bigger picture in the economy. Th th thanks, Ms. Graham. In terms of the guidance, um, we have started to be consulted now in terms of some changes that they are making to, uh, for example, some of the guidance on the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, so there have been better discussions now than was the case before Christmas. But um, you know, we were landed with the guidance on uh, the postal packages customs arrangements, uh, as I say, with about 11 hours notice. The guidance and rules of origin came out three days before companies were going to have to uh, bring it into effect. So, you know, that was just very, very difficult and regrettable that we had to work to those kinds of timescales. So it is a bit better now, but we do need to have, I think, guidance um, which is, I think, more related to the commercial supply chains that businesses are actually applying. Uh, you know, it can be a lot simpler, and we've made that point repeatedly to government. You make a very good point, Ms. Graham, about what's happening to, um, you know, sales. And uh, I noted yesterday that the OBR, for example, uh, suggested that there's quite significant paydowns of debt going on. Um, so people have been maybe able to save a wee bit if they're in a fortunate position to have some more disposable income because they're not paying bus or train fares. Um, and maybe not having you know costs in terms of buying clothing for work, um, but that is being used to pay down debt uh, rather than to stimulate the economy. So that is a concern. Uh, we will hope it comes back uh, as hopefully we get ourselves out of the pandemic. Um, but if we do have major structural changes to how people people work, you know more home working, less working in the office. Then some of these changes might become structural in terms of how much uh, people are buying. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, we do have time for um, some supplementaries. If any members uh, wish wish to come in with any supplementaries. I'm not getting any members. Telling me they wish to come in. Um, can I ask Mr. Mr. Phillips? Um, that I, in terms of Kenny Gibson's line of questioning, he talked a lot about the the movement, uh, as did you, of, of jobs um, from the UK to the continent. There's obviously been quite a lot of recent coverage with regards to um, financial services jobs going to Amsterdam. Uh, has there, have, do you have any examples of? Scottish firms moving jobs to Amsterdam? Um, no, thanks for the question. Not Amsterdam so much. Um, I think, to be honest, the jobs which have moved have been primarily to Dublin um, and to an extent in the insurance markets of Frankfurt, but there is a little bit uh, which goes to Amsterdam. Uh, but Dublin and Luxembourg are places where jobs have moved, and I think it's important that Scottish financial services are trying to build up links with these places. Uh, to make sure that, in terms of the support jobs, the delegated jobs which are still in Edinburgh, Glasgow, and Aberdeen, is that we try to maintain those as much as possible. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and and also for for Mr. Bain, you you have talked about um, the 
the Northern Ireland Protocol to, to an extent. Uh, we took evidence recently from the Fries and Galway Council uh, about uh, some of the challenges that they are facing with regards to um, Cairn Ryan um, and customs activity that will have to happen uh, there. Um, we also previously took evidence um, from the Northern Ireland Retail uh, Organisation about the importance of supply chains uh, in Scotland um, for getting goods uh, to Northern Ireland. Have you been in any specific talks about these challenges around the port at Cairn Ryan? Um, well, we've heard obviously the news about the uh, border control posts being put in place there. Um, um, we 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 have had um, some discussions with the Scottish government uh, ar around this, so that's been very useful. Um, uh, as I say, I think the what what we're really asking for in terms of you know uh, the UK government, Northern Ireland executive, the other devolved administrations, and the European Commission is to have joint engagement with businesses that are operating in in Northern Ireland. You know. It is a very difficult situation to make this work. There are, you know, different sensibilities around the protocol, and all of these have to be taken into account. But the crucial things are that, as things stand, it's just not possible for, um, you know, supermarkets or, or similar food uh, operators uh, to have that full compliance right now. So we need to work out whether we can get audited supply chains that can. Satisfy the requirements of EU legislation, but make sure that the we get those four-hour you know uh, shifts between the lorries being loaded and the goods arriving in Belfast not disturbed, because that's really central to providing uh, food for consumers in Northern Ireland. Thank you. I mean, do you think there is any threat to you know to the supply chain in in Scotland with regards to um, obviously we're setting up a new international port at Cairn Ryan uh, and that's competing with other ports that you know have experience as international ports. I was just quite struck by the Fries and Galloway Council telling me they'd have to find ways that they're going to make a profit. So you know they have no experience of running. An international port. I mean, do you think that there is a risk that business will move away from that crossing in Scotland? I think the sense is that um, because of, you, you know we were talking about highly perishable produce, you know, fish, um, meat, milk. Um, you know, really, the whole set of relationships would be improved if we had a veterinary agreement, and this is what we called for in the negotiations for the UK government. To reach a veterinary agreement, uh, they're saying that standards are going to remain the same. Well, in that case, we don't see how both sides can't reach an agreement like that that does away with the need for export health certificates. That's the biggest problem in terms of compliance, in terms of trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Scotland and Northern Ireland, in terms of food products. If we could get a veterinary agreement, do away with the EHCs, that would be an enormous help to everyone. Okay. Well, certainly the issue of EHCs is something that's come up by our other witnesses. Um, it's a very, very strong message that we're getting as a committee. So, uh, can I thank all our witnesses today for coming to give evidence uh, to us? It's been very helpful uh, for our inquiry, and we will now have a brief suspension before the cabinet secretary joins us. Thank you again.
Welcome back, everyone, to the meeting. We continue with agenda item one with further evidence on the EU UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement. And can I welcome to the meeting this morning Michael Russell, Cabinet Secretary for the Constitution, Europe and External Affairs. Uh, and he is accompanied by his officials David Barnes, the Deputy Director, EU Exit Strategy and Negotiations, Justin Mackenzie Smith, Deputy Director, EU Exit and Economy the Directorate for International Trade and Investment, and Lewis Hedge, Head of Regulatory Cooperation and Cross-Border Trade, all with the Scottish Government. Before we move to questions, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement of no more than three minutes? Thank you very much, Nina, and uh, thank you for the invitation to appear in front of this committee. I think this may well be my last appearance in front of this committee. Uh, not quite my last appearance in front of parliamentary committees. I think I've got a couple more to do. Thank you for your interest in and cooperation in this work over the uh, you and your committee members over over the last period. Um, and I look forward to seeing uh, you and the committee go from strength to strength in a new incarnation in uh, the next parliament. Let me make two very brief points. One is the immediate impacts of Brexit. You've heard evidence on that throughout your inquiry, but I do regard it as uh, inexcusable that Scottish businesses are, in fact, live testing an extraordinarily complex, costly and time-consuming set of new procedures, which were put in place virtually overnight on the 1st of January. The new barriers to trade result from the Trade and Co Cooperation Agreement that are a direct consequence of the specific type of Brexit sought by the UK government. Increased costs for businesses and consumers, increased bureaucracy, significant delays and the uncertain business environment are the price that Scotland is paying for the UK government's misguided and indeed wrong-headed concept of sovereignty. And as day follows night, this deliberate choice will harm Scotland's economic growth and stifle investment and innovation. Uh, the consequences of leaving the single market and the customs union were clearly documented by the Scottish government back in 2016. Throughout the negotiations, it was clear that the pursuit of the UK government's version of sovereignty would come with consequence, and it has. I thought David McAllister put it very well on the 25th of February when he said to you, the problem is and remains Brexit, and especially the kind of Brexit the UK decided to implement. My second point concerns the immediate and longer term prospects of the future EU-UK relationship. Um, no doubt we'll come on to this, convener, but I, I do note with, with some alarm this morning that Simon Coveney, in discussing what has just happened with the protocol, said that the EU is seeing that it is negotiating with a partner it simply cannot. And that is a very, very serious thing for a foreign minister to say. The evidence proves that, this, that, that the row over diplomatic status between the EU and the UK ambassadors is simply a symptom of a wider malaise. And that wider malaise is very uh, concerning and damaging, particularly when it draws in the fragile si situation in Northern Ireland. The Scottish Government will do its best to influence developments. We are in discussion at official level about how the devolved governments will be engaged both in these issues and in the wider governance of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. And I'm sure you will want to talk about that today. My position on these matters will not be a surprise to any of your members. I'm happy to discuss it with them, but I do hope that we can move in time and as quickly as possible to a more stable and better relationship, which in my view demands independence. Thank you very much. Um, that's a very interesting opening statement. I mean, that lack of trust uh, that that you mentioned. Um, it would be interesting if you could reflect on how you think that might influence further negotiations. Because, as we both know, this is a very bare bones deal, and we just heard from the financial sector, for example, about their hope for negotiating an equivalence agreement. Uh, this is just one example of the things that still require to be negotiated. Um, uh, and David McAllister talked about that last week as well. That the snub with regards to diplomatic diplomatic recognition for the EU. I mean, what what are our hopes of negotiating these um, additions to the deal, which are very, very important, given that lack of trust? Well, uh, there's a range of issues that are going to arise, and it would be best that they arose in the context of, of a positive and productive relationship. That is actually what the EU27 have indicated they wish. They were, I think, in the vast majority, pretty horrified by the way in which they were treated during the negotiations in the in the last period. Uh, and there was very strong commentary 
on the way in which particular David Frost operated. And I, I join in those criticisms. I'm sorry, I don't do it personally. Having uh, encountered uh, Mr. Lord Frost, as he now is, uh, a, a great deal over the last few years, I have to say that I think there was a deliberate attempt to play hardball, and it was to the disadvantage of the outcome uh, of these negotiations. Now, if that is starting up again, and it appears to be starting up again, then it will, uh, will be a very bad thing in terms of taking, first of all, the, the, the agreement to conclusion, because as you say, there are as aspects of the agreement that are not concluded as yet, and also then on building a better relationship. And I think it's just very, very foolish. Now, of course, it also governs the relationships with the devolved administrations. I, there hasn't been a meeting of the uh, JMCEN since the end of last year. Immediately uh, the, before Jan the, the end of December, we had a meeting which was frankly pointless to, to look at the agreement because we already knew what was in the agreement and it had already been pushed through or was in the process of being pushed through. But since then, there's been no discussion uh, of these issues. And indeed, the intergovernmental review remains completely stalled. Um, now, there may be a meeting, a quadrilateral meeting next week. It's been postponed, I think, every week in, in the last three weeks. But this is no way to conduct this. And it is a deliberate attempt by the UK government, both to diminish the involvement of the devolved administrations and to behave in a, a provocative way to the EU27. And it can be in no one's interest, not even their own. Mm. That's, that's interesting because my next question was going to be about how um, whether you had had any discussions about how the Scottish Government can input into the work of the Partnership Council, Specialised Committees, Working Group, uh, working groups where the work of these groups intersect with devolved competencies. I take it from what you're saying, you have not had those discussions. No, obviously discussions have started at official level, but you know there should have been a willingness to to come to this issue. Say, let's have a fresh start on this issue. Uh, there's the structure that we have agreed. Uh, let's get involved. Uh, let's make sure you know, that the devolved administrations, devolved governments, are part of this structure you know, without prejudice to the political positions we take. Which is you know, what we did, for example, in the preparations for No Deal, or tried to do um, on the first two occasions quite successfully, and the third occasion, I'd say, with much more difficulty, given that the Johnson administration was then in, in place. But the right thing to do would be to look at that structure to say there are huge areas there which impinge on devolved competence. And therefore, we need to make sure that the devolved administrations are involved. That has not happened. And, and you know, it, it, it may not happen. Um, I hope that I'm wrong, and I hope that in actual fact it will happen. But you know, we're now into, into March. There's been no such discussion. Um, the Northern Irish uh, parties, of course, uh, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister attend um, a, 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 the, the, the Specialist Committee, but we don't. We have no involvement in that. So I, I just think that there is no sign of a change, and my own view is that the presence of um, Lord Frost as, as a minister uh, will not facilitate that change. I, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. Is there a difference in uh, approach between uh, Mr. Gove and Lord Frost, for example? Yeah, yeah, I don't wish to. Scottish, and uh, he has actually, in fairness to Mr. Gove, he has come in front of our committee twice, which is better than previous um, UK ministers in this regard. Yes, I, I don't want to. I don't want to appear sentimental about not having Michael Gove as my counterpart. Uh, you know, that would that would not be true. Um, uh, but uh, you know, and, and he remains my opposite number in, in constitutional matters. But um, I I am willing to be proved wrong in terms of Lord Frost's approach and, and influence. I would like to be proved wrong, and I would like to think that he is going to very shortly uh, you know, uh, come to the devolved governments and say, we need you involved in these committees in this way. Please do come and do it. Uh, and if that happens, I shall be pleased to see it. I shall, I shall walk off into the sunset, feeling that at least uh, that has happened. But yeah, I'm not holding my breath for it. Thank you very much. And uh, can I take this opportunity to thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for um, for your engagement with the committee, which has um, it's been very helpful to us over the years. And wish you well. As uh, I don't think you are walking into the sunset, but certainly wish you well for the future. Thank you. And I now move on to questions from Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to start the discussion around Ken Ryan and the cabinet secretary. We know we took evidence from uh, the local authority and the port authority a few weeks ago. Um, since then, the government have announced uh, the mid announcement towards the end of February. 
um, about a new border control post and the government set out how it was going to go about that. Could you provide us an update um, on that and also whether that includes a port health authority or what discussions there have been around the creation of a port health authority, which will be necessary. That was previously a domestic port. Obviously, the status of Cairn Ryan is going to change significantly in the next, uh, the next, the next while. I have to seek help from my officials on the Port Health Authority issue. It's not one that I am immediately familiar with, but I can explain to you where the, the border point issue is. Um, we have announced our intention to use a special development order to create the border post, um, but we've done so in order to make sure that there is a we can meet the target date. And actually, that target date will have been moved back by the announcements of the last 24 hours. Uh, so we had hoped that we would be able to put some arrangements in place before the end of this year. I would think that that's fairly realistic now, uh, and they will be really required around the turn of this year or into the spring of next year. Um, but uh, in parallel with the Special Development Order, I have spoken to the convener and, and deputy vice convener of the council um, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it is a, a Labour SNP administration, as you know, um, and they have. I have pledged our involvement in community consultation, and we absolutely want to hear from the communities um, of, of that part, Stran Ryan, Ken Ryan. I've had a contact from local councillors in that area, and I've offered to meet them to, to talk to them about it as well. Uh, we have commissioned work from um, an outside body to look at a number of possible sites for the border point. Um, there are local preferences, which I've already heard, but I, I, the government will take no position on those until we've seen an assessment of those sites. We were using the Castle Kennedy Airfield as, as an emergency facility for overflow during uh, the, the first part of January, but it wasn't required, or certainly wasn't required in any great in terms of any great pressures. So we're not using it presently, but that we, that is one of the possible sites. But there are other sites available. Um, in terms of how it will operate, well, obviously there are issues uh, connected with the Northern Ireland Protocol. There are issues in terms of you know, the, the way in which we will operate and have to operate, as far as we're concerned, uh, which rub against resistance to the protocol in Northern Ireland. So there are some sensitive issues to go through, but we have the practical job of putting that in place, and we, we require to put it in place and will put it in place in collaboration with the local authority because they will have the responsibility of, of staffing it in terms of pilot sanitary inspection. Um, but perhaps one of David Barnes or, or somebody with him could answer about the Port Health Authority, or if not, we can write to you about that issue. Yes, I, can I just add, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned it was the local authority that would be responsible for the operation. Is there any discussions ongoing about additional support that the local authority might need? Yes, it would require to be additional. There would require to be additional support. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly I'm not avoiding that issue. Uh, of course, there, there will be, and, and that is something that will be actively discussed with them. And I've made that point at the start of it. I think we can do this in a very cooperative and collaborative way. We have to. Uh, you know, the difficulty has been persuading the UK government that this was required. Uh, they now accept that this is required. I think it will be harder to get money out of them, to tell you the honest truth. But uh, we will we will certainly recognise, of course, the local authority. It's, perhaps, David, or Mention on the port. Yeah, if someone could address the Port Health Authority point, that would be helpful. David Barnes? David? So I can uh, address that one. Uh, yes, you know. yes, please. Here we go. Lewis, you're on, Lewis, you're on mute. Yes, I, th I think for the for the, uh, for the tech team colleagues, you, it's David Barnes here. You've unmuted me, but in fact, it's Lewis Hedge who is the uh, who's going to answer this question. Good. Okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Convener Date and David. Um, so the Port Health Authority issue is it relates to the question of funding for the additional inspectors to come in and do checks at a, a border control post. Um, we've in fact invited uh, Dumfries and Gallery Council on, on in relation to this facility, but other local authorities too, in relation to other um, additional border requirements, to come forward uh, later this month with their requests for funding that they think they will need to uh, to front up the startup costs of building these these new teams. Um, so that is an active conversation that we are that we are having, um, and it's obviously not just the local authority, but other agencies too that are involved in in resourcing inspections when the facility is up and running. 
Um, can I just ask, Mr. Hedge, um, you mentioned it would be open to uh, other local authorities to apply, just for under clarity. Why would that be? Why would it not just be Dumfries and Galloway? So Dumfries and Galloway is the, the competent authority for this location, but there are other ports in Scotland where we are going to see additional border controls happening on goods arriving from the EU. So Grangemouth is an obvious one. Um, and so other local authorities are also going to see uh, uh, an increase in the demand for those uh, those, those services too. Okay, thank you. Um, and can, you know, can I just ask one final question to the um, Cabinet Secretary? Um, Cabinet, you, you mentioned the announcement last night around um, the Northern Irish border and the extension of the implementation um, period. And you've talked about the approach that's been taken by Lord Frost. Where do you see there being um, future disputes and uncertainty with the trade deal? And that's laying aside what is the what you've described as the current approach of the government. So that's um, the the attitude they take towards the deal. If we if we remove that from uh, the discussion and just focus on what is actually in the deal, where do you see there being points of tension and dispute as the deal starts to be implemented? It's a very interesting question. I mean, I think I I suggest there are two two issues which need to be thought about. One is that a lot of the coverage and discussion of this is as if there is a a, a temporary set of arrangements which are going to improve between now and you know everything working perfectly. That's not true. This this is you know what it's like. We are a third country. We will have to fill in more forms. There will be more bureaucracy. And we have not yet seen how that will affect ordinary everyday travel, because we've not been doing ordinary everyday travel. So I'm not going to I'm not going to look into a crystal ball, but I, I would say that I think that we will likely see a lot of difficulty when ordinary travel comes back. And there are volumes going between the between the UK and the EU. But I think also completing the work of of the negotiation. I mean, you know, there are whole swathes of this agreement which are not completed. Your financial services is one you've been hearing about this morning. You need goodwill on both sides to do that. And you know, good goodwill is is running out. I mean, if you've got you know Simon Coveney making remarks like that this morning, you know, you've, that goodwill is is disappearing. And I noticed somebody commenting this morning and saying, you know, the important thing uh, about relationships between states is that you know you have to have a robust relationship that can survive bad times. Mm. You know, there, that relationship is being weakened all the time. And when there are difficulties, it will arise out of nowhere sometimes. You, know, you won't have friends who you can rely on, alas. OK, uh, thank you, convener. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jimmy Halker Johnson next. Um, Thank you very much, convener. Good morning to the cabinet secretary and to um, his colleagues there. Um, th- there's a couple of um, issues that I wanted to have a look at. Can I, but before I do that, can I just clarify um, when, I, when we had Mark Thompson from Dumfries and Galloway and talking about port authority, uh, port health authority status, they suggested that they were looking around about two two million um, to cover some of the additional costs. Um, and when I asked, you know, who pays for it if the Scottish government didn't? Uh, doesn't he suggested that actually it was more likely to be a case of what they would therefore be able to deliver rather than who would pay for it? So, from what you, Cabinet Secretary, and from what your your um, uh, colleagues have said today, can we kind of get the hint that you are looking to provide Dumfries and Galloway with the support, this two million order they're asking for, to make sure that this they are able to provide um, full port health authority status? Oh, I, um, I, I, I would absolutely say I don't. I, I don't want to give you a hint, Mr. Harper Charles. I'll give you your promise that, uh, in actual fact, uh, that's what needs to happen, and we need to recoup that money from the UK government. So, you know, that is a. I'm sure you can help us to do that. So, you know, what we need to make sure is that there is no detriment to anybody as a result of this taking place. But I don't believe that the recent Galloway should suffer financially, and I don't believe the Scottish government should suffer financially. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, I, I I might be tempted to suggest that there's 200 million pounds worth of Brexit preparedness money come to the Scottish government, and that's probably what this sort of thing was for. But you and I may disagree on that. So if I can move on to um, another point, you talked, Cabinet Secretary, about goodwill between the EU and the UK, um, and I think that's obviously very important. Um, only a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, we saw a situation where uh, there was a threat from the European uh, Commission to trigger Article 16, and then a very quick 
well, relatively quick rowback after three and a half, I think uh, roughly three and a half hours. Could you uh, advise me where or how the Scottish Government uh, made uh, in an official capacity its concerns? Because I'm sure you had concerns over the actions of the EU Commission or the suggestions coming out of the EU Commission. How you made those concerns um, uh, uh, apparent to the EU Commission in an official capacity? Of course. of course, of course. Now, it happened so quickly that, of course, on a Friday evening, if I remember correctly, uh, that it was in actual fact uh, there and gone before uh, you know, we made an official complaint. But I think I was actually in advance of condemning this of uh, uh, your own colleagues. Um, I made it very clear publicly through social media that I was very critical of this and very opposed to it, as a result of which I don't think I actually did it single-handed, but as a result no. of which the, you know, it was withdrawn. And uh, therefore, I was grateful. And I said publicly that I thought that was the right thing to happen. I want to associate myself with your criticism of that. It was foolish and wrong to do so. I'm sure you would want to associate yourself with my criticism of a parallel action that seems to have been taken in terms of announcing uh, changes uh, to the, the operation of the protocol without consulting the EU. Uh, both were foolish. I mean, I, I, I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary, but, and, I, and I did see your social media, and I understand that you're, um, that, that's fine, but your social media is, is not official government, uh, is not an official government account. And I know it might seem um, it might seem uh, a little kind of technical on this, but as I say, was there, was there any through official Scottish government accounts or uh, uh, or communication lines any uh, concerns, criticism, issues, condemnation made to the European Commission within those three and a half hours? I appreciate it was a Friday evening, but but you know, government is, I'm That's sure, me. as you'll agree, 24 hours. Had it continued, I, I would have uh, formally objected to the EU. Fortunately, the mistake was rectified very, very quickly. And, you know, it, one of the things of getting a good relationship is when somebody makes a mistake and withdraws that mistake, you're pleased and you show you're pleased. I don't think it would have helped anybody had you done anything else. But, you know, maybe, maybe we should have, uh, maybe we should have said, you know, we're extremely displeased. But I actually was rather pleased that it was withdrawn. And I'm sure you were too. I was delighted um, that it was withdrawn, but it should never have happened in the first place. But it does concern mm -hmm. me that what you're suggesting is that within even a three and a half, four hour schedule, the Scottish Government were somehow unable or unwilling to comment uh, or, or, or to, or to you know, make your position clear in an official capacity. But let, let, let's, let's move on from that. Can I, can I look at another issue? And this is my last issue um, that I wanted to raise, um, convener. Um, the Scottish Government obviously has a number of hubs uh, 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 in, uh, across, the, uh, across a number of different um, countries. Can I ask, um, I suppose, how many of those are cited within UK government facilities, such as um, embassies or consulates, and what the kind of plans are um, for those going forward, whether, the, whether you're looking at any new, new sites to be able to provide support for Scottish businesses or the like, both within the EU and also globally? Yeah, we, we co-locate where it's in our interest to do so, and uh, that arrangement works sometimes. It doesn't work sometimes. Um, you know, uh, for example, we co-locate in Dublin, but there have been active discussions as to whether that works for us. We co-locate in Paris and in Berlin. We do not co-locate in Brussels. We're around the corner, actually, from uh, uh, Accra, and <coughs> we have a very successful operation there. Um, we have talked about, and, and I think would have moved by now to, to move into Scandinavia, but the last year and a bit has, has proved difficult with that. I take a very pragmatic view of this. If there is a benefit of co-location, as indeed happens with independent countries, sometimes co-locate with others to make it effective, then that should happen. If it's in our interest not to do so, then we don't do so. Uh, it's not a big issue for me, but I do think that the uh, representation we have elsewhere, uh, both in the EU and, and uh, with the EU, is very successful uh, and it is a very good way of attracting interest in and support for Scotland. For example, the Scotland House in Brussels, uh, run by Mike Nielsen, who is who's shortly to retire and has been very, very distinguished in the role, has gained a significant reputation uh, for the work it's done. And indeed, yet la yesterday they organised um, the EU Friends of Scotland, and there is a Friends of Scotland group in the European Parliament. Uh, they organised a plenary meeting, uh, which I addressed, and uh, you know, I think that's been a very positive thing. 
I mean, when, when you talk about, um, I, I don't know, I can't remember the exact term you used, but in terms of where you might not want to relocate, whether it works or not, is that is that a space issue in some cases, or is that, um, uh, well, well you, you can perhaps tell me that. And, and, and as, as I say, you know, looking from a more global point of view, obviously you talked about Scandinavia, but um, wider afield, are there areas where you are particularly considering perhaps uh, a new hub, a new office, whether it's within um, existing UK facilities or your own uh, uh, or Scotland's own, uh, uh, you know, facility. Well, I, I think you know, Mr. McKee would be in a good position to talk to you about that because some of that is is driven by trade issues, uh, not entirely, but some of it. Sometimes the diaspora is important to us. Uh, you know, in, in in the United States and Canada, that's been the case. I've been instrument. I was instrumental a decade ago when I was previously external affairs minister in seeking co-location in Canada, but co-location between a number of Scottish uh, organisations, and that, of course, is what exists at Scotland House in London, where we have a range of Scottish organisations that uh, are together in, a, in very good premises uh, on the embankment, uh, which provides also facilities for business. This has been a, a successful part of our strategy, and, and I hope uh, everybody can get behind it and encourage it because it, it, it projects Scotland in a very positive way. Okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Stuart Stevenson. Stuart Stevenson, can you hear me? I had to switch my mic on manually myself, Karina. I was waiting for it to happen. But I'm now here. Um, uh, just to close off, uh, century, one of the things uh, Jamie Halcro Johnson was pursuing. Um, does the refusal of the UK government to recognise that there should be diplomatic relationships uh, between the UK and the EU, the refusal to recognise the ambassador of the EU, make it easier or more difficult uh, to uh, communicate on matters such as the one we've just been talking about when they arise? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's more difficult if any country is is not accepting the diplomatic norms. I've I've spoken with the EU um, ambassador to to London, a, a, a very civilised and, and experienced Portuguese European diplomat. Um, I think he has goodwill towards the UK and goodwill towards Scotland, and it seems a pity that the UK should behave in such a petty way. I think it's very important that these proprieties are observed, uh, and I hope the UK will be more sensible about them. Uh, right. Let me a matter more substantially of interest to me and my uh, constituents, which is, of course, um, getting fish into Europe, uh, essentially. Uh, and, and indeed, since we also import fish uh, from Europe uh, in the months to come, that may become an issue uh, as well. And I just wonder if you could give us an update on uh, whether there are any improvements in the current situation um, that, that you foresee. And I'm not. I'm not asking. Uh, about making the practical issues work, but uh, in particular, I look at pages 902 to 906 of the TCA, which lay out the quotas uh, for our, our fishermen and have been quite disastrous uh, for some uh, sectors of our economy, and of course the phytosanitary uh, difficulties that are being used to keep uh, our shellfish essentially. Uh, out of Europe. Uh, all of these would appear to be things that would require a renegotiation of the TCA. Is that a realistic prospect? No, it is not a realistic prospect, regrettably. And we now know, for example, that George Euston was aware, Eustace was aware of the situation with shellfish. Um, so th th I don't think the UK walked into this blind. I think they knew what they were doing. I think what they didn't think about was the effect it would have. I noticed that um, there was evidence being given to the Environment, Rural and, and uh, Food and Rural Affairs Committee at Westminster this week on these issues, and I was very struck by a couple of the pieces of evidence that they got. Uh, Sarah Horsfall, the chief co-chief executive of the Shellfish Association of Great Britain, said, "You could not have written it any worse if you had wanted to for the industry," referring to to the agreement. So that really is pretty damning. And then um, the a senior manager at the Southwest England fishing company, Waterdance, said there are some extreme forces operating on the supply chain. We will probably see some forced consolidation of business failure. 
We're struggling to find markets for some of the products we previously had very good markets for through small-scale exporters, and the costs have risen dramatically. This is a perfect storm. It's a perfect storm caused by uh, the issues you're identifying, which is the agreement is a defective agreement. It is not what was promised the fishing industry, but actually, it's also a bad agreement. It, you know, it's a bad agreement in terms of their judgment. It's a bad agreement in terms of having a professional agreement because it's got lots of holes in it. You know, um, but in addition to that, the idea that in some sense it will improve over a period of time is also untrue. You know, we are a third country. I mean, you know, you can get the technical parts of it to work a wee bit better because people get used to them. But you can't actually overcome some of the regulatory problems. There is the problem that I have referred to several times in this country, which is you can catch as much fish as you want. If you can't get them to a market to buy them, then it's a pointless exercise. And there is then when you go forward, you know, this, um, I, I suppose it's not jam today. I suppose you could call it cod or halibut tomorrow. You know, that in five and a half years' time, there will be a new agreement which will be better. Actually, in five and a half years' time, the link between fisheries and other issues grows stronger. So actually, what has been negotiated here is not something that you want with one bound and after five and a half years, you could be free. Actually, uh, it's not going to change. And if there was any attempt to change it, it would be uh, catastrophically bad for other parts of the agreement. So I'm afraid, um, you know, for the second time in a generation, no matter how you define the generation, uh, the UK government has let down appallingly the Scottish fishing industry. Uh, thank you, Kevin. You, you, you'll be aware, as uh, I was, that the headline on the Frankfurt uh, Allegheny said, he quoted Douglas Adams and said, uh, um, "So long and thanks for all the fish." So we know what the Europeans thought about the deal. But the, the, the UK government has established the Scottish Seafood Foods Export Task Force. Um, does the participation of the Scottish government in that? Um, give us any insight into any improvement that we might sensibly uh, see, uh, or is it simply focusing on doing what it can to mitigate the domestic effects of the uh, this appalling agreement? Well, you know, I, I would like to think there would be substantial cooperation to mitigate what can be mitigated. I mean, a lot can't be mitigated, but what can be mitigated. I think it got off to a bad start when the, the industry wanted to have you know, co-chairs, proper representation to make things work, and that was just ignored by the UK government. And that's sort of symptomatic of where you get to its silly stuff. You know, it, it, it wouldn't have mattered to the UK government to have co-chairs, and in actual fact, it would have added a dimension. Uh, but instead, there was a you know, it, not a refusal; they just ignored what other people wanted. I think that's silly. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I profoundly disagree with the policy on Brexit. I think it has been foolish. I think it has proved to be foolish. And all that. But I have always tried to differentiate between that and trying to get some working arrangements to make things better. And, and you know, it, it gets very frustrating when others are not trying to do that. But you keep trying, and they should keep trying, because it's very important we provide every assistance we can to, to fishermen in every part of the industry. And I, I don't need to tell you, Mr. Stevenson, but you know, this is not a homogenous industry. There are there are you know people um, in the shellfish sector in my my area you know who are very badly affected. There are people in the in the in your deep sea sector are much very badly affected. There are some people who are going and are floating their their catches in other countries in Denmark. There are, there are other people who there, there are foreign boats EU boats which are not coming now into the northwest of Scotland because it's too complicated and too difficult to do so. This right across the board is a bad a rotten deal, and it's having severe effect. And you know, I think we should all be trying to mitigate what we can mitigate and not playing games. Uh, thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. And we now move to questions from Christine Graham, MSP. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I've got four questions pretty well following on from the questions I asked in the previous section. Uh, the first is with regard to small to medium enterprises, the substantially largest number of enterprises in Scotland, and the evidence we had about the labyrinth of red tape, the short notice that were given on the guidance, and the quality of the guidance. So that is my first question. Um, is there any way the Scottish Government has been able to mitigate uh, this for these small to medium enterprises so they can work their way through all this new red tape? 
Well, where it's been possible to help, for example, in the food and phytosanitary inspection side through the hubs, then that has been done and is being done. And the hubs have been you know, moderately successful. Uh, we've certainly done everything we can to help with paperwork and, and elsewhere there and to speed the process up. So I, I'm, I'm pleased that we've made some difference there. That does not apply outside a, the, the, the food, and, food and drink sector. Um, so then there are many other companies experiencing. I, I have, I, I can't name them, but I have one in my own constituency who wrote to me, has written to me a couple of times in the last month. And um, they, they say to me that, a, and let me quote this because I think it's important, inventory and goods handling capacity within continental Europe will be established progressively through 2021. Now one of the highest priorities of our business was recruitment of EU-based personnel forming part of this change. The irony of this outcome, given the Brexit rhetoric around jobs and business opportunities, couldn't be starker. So what is happening is small companies that can do it are saying the only way we're going to survive is actually setting up European operations and moving jobs to Europe. And that is happening. So the companies can afford that. That is taking place. I can't help them to do so because we shouldn't be exporting jobs. But that is what is taking place. Others will simply and are simply giving up on a sector of their business that they cannot fulfill. And that is very obvious. So if we can help, for example, through Scottish Enterprise, for larger or companies or growth companies, then we're also doing that. But I think there are sectors of the economy where people have just said, either we don't do this, or we, we export the jobs and we export the effort that we're, we're undertaking. I mean, there are some particularly egregious examples which, which cannot be helped you know, by normal procedures. I have a I have a company in my own area which has a particularly important part of its machinery, which comes from a European country being repaired at the present moment. It has been stuck for two months because of difficulties with paperwork. And, and the problem is that getting the paperwork right is essential if you're a third country. And it's very difficult to break your way through that. My, my second question is, um, which uh, I teased out that there will be empty supermarket shelves, particularly with regard to perishables, fruit and vegetable coming in from places perhaps such as Portugal. Um, you know, are you aware of all this? And I appreciate that this is something perhaps beyond the remit of the Scottish Government, but perhaps there's an opportunity for local producers in Scotland to have seasonal goods. Do you see this as a completely negative or a positive or what? What's your comment? Okay. You know, we should adapt to circumstances, even if we don't like the circumstances. I mean, I, you know, I think it's, I mean, it is ridiculous that we are talking about a circumstance in which, you know, the flows of fruit and vegetables in established supply chains are being interrupted. I mean, you know, this is not what anybody voted. Well, we didn't vote for Brexit anyway, but that's not what anybody voted for. But yes, if there are opportunities for, you know, just as the, the lockdown has produced opportunities for some companies, if there are opportunities to do things differently, then I'm sure they will. But they won't be able to substitute entirely. I mean, you know, with, with the greatest you know, respect, it is not possible to grow, um, you know, all the, 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 the things that are grown in, uh, in greenhouses in Portugal or southern Spain in uh, Akhilte Bui. I mean, you can grow some of them, but you can't grow all of them and not in commercial, uh, uh, commercial quantities. So, uh, you know, it, it will not be possible to replace. Now, I, I don't want to exaggerate this. People are not going to starve as a result of this, but there is going to be a diminution of the quality of life, and that is what Brexit is bringing about. And some people will suffer financially. Uh, my, my third question was about um, the impact of COVID uh, in, uh, in the middle of Brexit. Uh, because this undoubtedly has exacerbated uh, problems. And given that I made the comment, in my view, we may, may not agree that we are basically, the UK is basically a consumer economy, a consumer economy often built on credit. This again exacerbates the wider economy because we've changed our shopping habits. These may be permanent. We've changed what we buy and how we buy it. And of course, people who were able to perhaps, you know, uh, get by using credit will not be doing it now because of losing their jobs are probably having to deal with a lot of debt. Can you give a comment, Cabinet Secretary, on, my, on what I've just said and how that might impact on the Scottish economy? Well, there are, there's, you know, a lot of published information that will show, I think shows quite clearly, there will be a drop in GDP as a result of Brexit. Uh, you know the level of the drop is 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 clear. It is admitted by the UK government. Uh, you know I, I don't want to add to the burden of paper that you have, but we can provide you with paper or in electronic form the documents that we have published, and there's, there's a plenty of this material. 
Something I referred to earlier on, I think, to, to, to Claire Baker will apply here too. I have no doubt that you, the reason there was no extension sought was in to essentially hide the economic effect of Brexit behind the economic effect of COVID. I'm sure of that. It was you know, at least part of the thinking. And um, you know, and that is what has taken place. But what cannot be hidden will be the effect that will be obvious to ordinary people when travel resumes, because they will they, you know, the last time substantial numbers traveled from here to 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 Spain or to Portugal or to France or to Germany was before COVID. And when they go back, then, you know, they may think some of that change is due to COVID, but they will discover that the change of being a third country, of not being able to use the passport gates, of very much longer delays, of issues to do with, you know, access to phone roaming and things like that, will be as a result of Brexit. And I think that, that will, people will, will wake up to that there and then. I hope what they don't do is follow some of the, you know, prejudice that says, oh, this is all the EU's fault. I hope they look at this and say, oh, dear, this is because of Brexit. You know, this is not something we wanted to happen. Well, you preempted really my final question, which was simply, should Brexit have been pursued in the midst of a COVID pandemic? Well, actually, the, the most interesting point of that, I have to say today to me, is the attempt to change the border operating model and to postpone it yet again. That suggests to me that there was also an empirical need to have a period uh, of extension because you know, the, the border was not ready for the change. That's what it says very clearly. And by refusing to do so, then they've created circumstances where they've had to then change the border operating model and they have got themselves into these difficulties with the Northern Ireland Protocol. So quite clearly, there should have been an extension, as we said at the time, as everybody said at the time. But of course, the UK government refused to do it. Uh, you said, as everybody said at the time, who's everybody? Well, everybody who didn't was not blinded by the ideological obsession with Brexit, uh, or was not, uh, you know, nervous about speaking up. Uh, you know, the Scottish government did, and the Scottish Parliament did actually by a majority. So uh, I think I think the everybody is those who saw this coming, alas. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, uh, Christine Graham. I will now take questions from Dean Lockhart. Thanks very much, Convener, and uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Thanks. It was uh, good to hear you define the generation as more than 40 years in your response to Stuart Stevenson. Um, my question today follows up on a, a previous discussions we've had in relation to the decline of the value of EU structural funds available to Scotland. Um, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can confirm, or his officials, the level of decommitments and the decline in EU structural funds coming to Scotland over the past uh, applicable period, that the structural funds have been suspended since November of 2019 as a result of deficiencies in the Scottish Government management system, and that the Scottish Government might face potential penalties from the EU Commission as a result of the suspension of this programme? Well, structural funds are a very complex area, and um, I, I think the best way I could provide information on this, which I'm happy to do, is with written evidence to the committee on structural funds and the issues. There has been some reporting of this, uh, which you're obviously aware of. Um, I think the reporting does not fully uh, 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 tackle the complexity of the situation, nor indeed of the need to conclude this in a, in a positive way for Scotland. But I, I'm not trying to evade an answer on this, but I cannot give you a full accounting for the structural funds at this time, but I am happy to provide that information for publication by the committee. I, I'm also perhaps just keen to, to, to clarify that uh, I, was ex I was quoting the um, UK government's view of a generation not approving it. It, th thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I appreciate you might not have the exact sums in front of you, but it would be useful, certainly to follow up in writing, but it would be useful to understand if, if potential penalties may be imposed by the U European Commission as a result of the suspension of these funds, and what the underlying cause of the suspension of these funds uh, has been. Well, I'm very happy to provide you with that information. But you know, structural funds are dealt with usually by either the finance secretary or the business secretary, and therefore I think rather than give you an inaccurate account of this, I would want to give you an accurate account of this by getting information from my colleagues 
making sure that you are provided with that information and the committee can discuss it. I understand again in relation to the financials that might be something for the finance secretary, but in terms of the administration of the EU structural funds, I would imagine perhaps not yourself, but your your colleagues, the officials on the meeting, might be able to confirm that the programme was suspended since November 2019 and, and underlying reason for, for that? Well, I think it's best that we provide you with the accurate information based on what we understand to be the situation at present. It is a complex situation. So I'm not trying to avoid answering you. I'm trying to give you a complete and comprehensive answer, and I'm very happy to do so as soon as we possibly can, and certainly you know, within the next week or so. But I think I do want to make sure that that is vouched for by the ministers responsible for the situation. That, 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 that's appreciated, Cabinet Secretary. And let me just finish off with, with one final question then. Um, we await the, the details of the, 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 the numbers and, and more detail, but the, the, the possibility of penalties being imposed by the EU Commission, presumably that is something, if that was a potential outcome, that would be something you were aware of. So are you aware of the EU Commission potentially uh, imposing penalties on the Scottish Government for suspension well, of this programme? It wouldn't necessarily be something I'm aware of because I do not deal with, the, as I've indicated, the, the, the distribution of funds. Uh, but if you, would, if you wish a general answer to that, then clearly I would be concerned. But you know, we have been through periods before when there have been questions on particular projects, and that happens in every country uh, and happens regularly because there are always questions. I hope we are able always to answer those questions comprehensively and completely and avoid any downside at all, and that will always be our ambition. I wonder if would any of the officials be able to comment on some of these questions if they have the detail available or some of the details I've been asking about? Well, I, I think I've made it clear that we're going to provide the information to you, uh, and I think that that's the proper way to do so. Um, I don't know if any officials would like to add to that, but I, I think that that would be, in my view, uh, to make sure you have the best and most accurate answer. Okay. Well, we'll wait for further information, but Cabinet Secretary, given the importance of structural funds and the various discussions we've had on this topic before, I do find it, I must say, slightly surprising you don't have this information uh, in terms of potential penalties being imposed and the suspension of the funds. Most of this is in the public domain, as you said, so I would have expected this level of detail certainly to be available. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I, I, you know, I, I have to say you know, that I feel disappointed myself, for example, that I have no idea the level of funds to replace these funds that will come from the UK government. But I've lived with that disappointment for the last three years since they announced it. So I suppose I'll just have to live a little longer, as will you, alas. Well, if you read the budget document uh, yesterday, it confirms the level of funding will uh, of EU funds will be at least uh, replaced. So that's, uh, I can uh, give you some assurance on that point. But uh, I look forward to your written response, Cabinet Secretary. Sure. And convener, I've taken up most of my time. I'll pass back to you. Thank you very much. And our, our last questioner um, is Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, uh, Mr. Russell. It is indeed the end of an era, and I, uh, for one, will certainly regret your uh, leaving of the Parliament. Uh, and wish you all the best in pastures new. Uh, on, on the point that um, Mr. Uh, Lockhart raised, I, I recall uh, way back in 2016 that the Prime Minister, in response to a question from Patricia Gibson MP, it said that uh, a replacement for the shared um, for, for, for European structural funds. The prosperity fund uh, would be in place, in, but, um, but long before Brexit, and indeed consultation was going to take place to end before the end of that year, and it never ever took place. So I think that uh, the Tories are on, um, you know, on difficult ground on that one. But I want to focus on uh, on uh, uh, the issue of uh, the economic impact. The CBI submitted uh, evidence today, which uh, in great detail talked about the impact of guidance, IT system disruption, delays, and clearance. Concerns over enforcement levels, increased costs, bilateral communication, by which they meant the 35% tariff for rules of origin, uh, difficulties in enforcement, and UK EU services trade difficulties going forward. And then we subsequently heard from Willie Bain and his evidence that some 200,000 SMEs traded 
before uh, um, Brexit uh, with Europe, but many are um, reluctant or have difficulty in doing so now. Uh, has the Scottish Government um, undertaken any um, kind of review or analysis of the economic impact on Scotland of Brexit um, and what it thinks it will be in the next uh, year or indeed in the years ahead, uh, given these concerns, given the fact that some of them appear to be deepening rather than lifting? Yeah, I think you can. There are two levels to this, um, and, and certainly I, I would echo your view about the, the shared prosperity fund and the formal comparatively little. And I was interested in, in Mr. Lockett's use of words. I don't think we had any monies confirmed uh, yesterday. We had a statement made of what they might be uh, confirmed. Would be when I see the colour of that money. I'm skeptical whether we see it. But let me let me put this in two levels. The first level is to say we published extensively uh, over a long period of time. On the cost of Brexit, and uh, you know, the Scotland's Place in Europe papers have all that information, and I, I know you're familiar with them, but happy to to have them sent to you again. And the, we we know, for example, that uh, the dealers agreed will we think cut Scots, cut Scotland's GDP by around 6.1 percent. That's nine billion in 2016 cash terms by 2030 compared to UK membership. The Office for Budget Responsibility published economic model, model on the, uh, a, a very typical agreement, very similar to the one that happened, model for 5.2% of UK GDP being lost over 15 years. So we will be poorer as a result. But then we, we need to cut down below that and to actually see what individual, how individual sectors would, would operate. Now, the Scottish Salmon Producers Association, uh, and uh, that's an industry who I think would be regarded as well prepared for Brexit, reported losses of at least £11 million in January alone as a direct result of the changes brought about by Brexit. Scottish farmers could lose out on about £170 million between now and 2025, compared with the subsidies they could have expected under the Common Agricultural Policy. Scotland Food and Drink are saying that the Scottish seafood exporters are losing uh, around £1 million in sales a day at the present moment because of what's happening. They see potato producers. Uh, are facing losses in the region of 11 million pounds. The Scottish Association of Meat Wholesalers estimate an annual bill for export health certificates, just uh, export health certificates, of a million pounds across the, the whole sector. Scottish Engineering reported in February that only 25% of businesses were registering no or little impact from Brexit processes, while 56% reported the harmful impact of additional administration costs. So then you begin to see at the business level what the problems are financially. And then there's the wider issues of, of interruption to trade I've, I've quoted earlier on. People who can't get things repaired, people who are having to fill in lots of extra forms. Um, and then to add to that, I'm sorry to give you a long answer, Mr. Gibson, but there's some additional information. The costs that build up, you know, uh, money could be spent better elsewhere. But we've had to allocate millions of pounds to food standards to put in place new regimes to ensure continuity and safety of food exports. Uh, we've put in 7.75 million packages of support for fishers, agricultural businesses, and ports and harbours. The Food and Drink Recovery Plan has required additional money. And then, of course, we've been talking about already, Ken Ryan, additional costs. This is a very, very expensive project, and there isn't actually a benefit from it. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, answer, uh, Cabinet Secretary. But would you agree that it's not just sectors that actually are adversely affected? One of the most adversely affected group, uh, groups is young people. And I'll just take you back to a debate only last night when um, addressing a virtual audience of young voters during BBC Scotland's debate night, Aberdeenshire Conservative MP Andrew Bowie said, and I quote, Am I going to sit here and say that Brexit is perfect and that your generation is going to reap the benefits? No, I am not, because you are not, frankly. And when he was pressed on whether the younger generation are going to reap the rewards of benefit, this vice chairman of the Conservative Party in Scotland replied, not right now. Um, how do you feel young people in particular are being affected by Brexit? Um, uh, for example, uh, the inability to work and um, uh, travel abroad, not just because of COVID, but uh, Beyond that, through Brexit. Well, you've got a, you've got a structural problems that will come from the lack of Erasmus, for example. I, you know, I thought I thought the evidence you had on that earlier today was interesting. You know, the, the attempt to say that the Turing scheme will provide some 
major uh, advantages over Erasmus is simply nonsense. And the loss of the Erasmus program will be grievous. We're doing our very best to mitigate it, but it will be grievous. But you're right to emphasize the wider issues. You know, the expectations that you and I had, and though I'm a little older than you, not a lot older than you, but the Going. expectations you, that you and I had, uh, had of, of being able to travel freely without, as the UK passport says, without let or hindrance across Europe to be able to work there, to be able to study there, those will be far harder. They will completely disappear, but they'll be far harder. And I saw Andrew Murray's statement, and um, he looked like a man under some pressure ahead. And the pressure is of his own making, because what he has done is supported a policy that his own constituents, by and large, did not vote for, that Scotland did not vote for. Uh, and and uh, he is continuing to support something which is costly without benefit. And, and he has to admit that, and he has admitted it. Uh, and what he should now do is apologize for it and see that the policy has changed. And, of course, the best way to do that is to secure independence. Mm. And indeed, of course, Mr Bowie did not actually support Brexit, but he's helping to railroad it through. Um, just one last point, and that's the, dish, that, that's the issue of uh, visas to EU countries. Again, the CBI has said that uh, they have concerns about a lengthy process of eight to ten weeks, and they talk about one um, uh, company uh, has seen up to 40 employees who work with customer commitments in Germany, France and Spain impacted. Um, what is your, your position or your view on how this uh, issue is again impacting on businesses? And one of the issues I raised earlier on was about the fact that this could um, make Scottish and indeed other UK firms less and less um, enthusiastic, shall we say, about even attempting to trade with Europe and therefore increasing our insularity rather than our internationality. Well, you know, it, it, the ease by which people could work in other European countries, we, we, we've thrown away, and we've thrown away for no good purpose, uh, because it was a remarkable thing. I mean, it just doesn't exist elsewhere. You know, the opportunity that we've had to, to interchange has been hugely beneficial for benefit business and hugely beneficial for Scotland, for people coming in, too. Throwing that away for some uh, a reason that is impossible to understand um, will be detrimental to business. And as, as I indicated from that company in my constituency, companies forced into this position will set up either subsidiaries or, or, or their main companies elsewhere, and we will lose jobs. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. That comes, uh, we've now come to the end of our questions for the Cabinet Secretary, unless there are any supplementaries. Um, which I ha I'm not seeing uh, indicated. If you want to type your R in the chat box, I'll bring you in. Um, Cabinet Secretary, if I could just, you know, like uh, perhaps remind, remind us all of some of the people that are most directly impacted by this, and that's European citizens living in Scotland. And of course, the First Minister wrote an open letter to them uh, in December last year, uh, explaining some of the support mechanisms the government had had. Um, had put in place, but also reminding them with regards to the UK government's settlement scheme, however unwelcome, uh, encouraging them to apply before the deadline of June this year. Um, do you know how things are going uh, two months in uh, for our EU citizens? Are you uh, satisfied that they are feeling any more secure, and do you have a message for them? No, I'm not satisfied they're feeling any more secure, but I want them to know how welcome they are in Scotland and how we need them and value them and want them to continue to be here. Uh, and, and that is a message that goes out from the First Minister. My colleague Jenny Goruth is now responsible for uh, migration and, and therefore has a whole responsibility for this and is very proactive in, in making sure that people understand how important and welcome they are. Um, you know, the, the loss of freedom of movement, as, as I just said to Mr Gibson, is, is grievous <coughs> and it's affected you know, all of us. But it's particularly badly affected those who come to make their, their lives here. I, I was talking to a, a Polish lady yesterday who, um, it's just a small detail, but it's an interesting detail, was telling me that um, we were talking about the cost of, of, of sending things. And she was saying that she wanted her daughter, who's Scottish, married to, she's married to a Scott uh, woman, uh, had said that she wanted to get books in Polish so their child can, can become more fluent in the language. And the cost of getting those from Poland is now greater than the cost of the books themselves. So there are barriers being put up in small ways, uh, which are going to be disadvantageous. Um, and and that, that will affect people's lives, and it will make people decide how they live the rest of their lives. Now, you know, many are settled here and, and, and want to stay here. But some people who are marginal will say, is it worth it? 
you know, wouldn't I be better off just I know and I'm not going to be subject to this. So it's going to be difficult, but we are we'll do everything we can to encourage people to stay and we want them to stay. And and we believe their contribution is really important. And you know, I've I've worked hard on that over the last coming on for five years and it's work that we'll have to continue. Thank you for that. Um, no one else has indicated that they have any supplementaries, Cabinet Secretary. So once again, thank you and your, your officials uh, for your evidence today. And once again, I'll just repeat my best wishes for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We shall now move into private session.